Kas kā varētu arī būt sākt? Labdien, daigi iedaugi un kolēģi, dombiedri, priecājos jūs redzēt ikgadējā kognitīvo zinātņu sesijā Latvijas universitātes starptautiskās ikgadējās konferences ietvaros. Tā kā mūsu šī gada sesija ir divvalodīga, jo dažas prezentācijas būs latviešu, bet cits būs angļu valodā, atļauj pārslēgties uz angļu valodu, protams, ka mēs darba gaitā pielāgosimies jautājumiem atkarībā no prezentācijas valodas. Hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to our um, annual cognitive science session within the University of Latvia International Research Conference. And um, I'm delighted because of the variety and diversity of the uh, topics covered by today's session. And uh, we have a, a very dense program. And uh, therefore, I would like to, uh, to go ahead with our uh, first um, um, uh, talk. Um, and uh, well, uh, just um, uh, one, one remark regarding our uh, timing. We will have um, uh, 15, roughly 15 minutes uh, for uh, presentation. And then. Uh, uh, tentatively five minutes for questions. I mean, of course, you can you can have less than five minutes uh, for uh, questions if you are speaking uh, longer. So this is up to you, sort of. Okay, so let's go ahead with the first uh, presentation. And I'm delighted to uh, welcome Anastasia Nikiforova, uh, assistant professor at the um, uh, Faculty of Computing. We'll talk about the user-centered analysis of the usability of open government data portals. The floor is yours, Anastasia. Yes, thank you. Let me share my screen. Just a second. So I hope that my screen is seen right now. And I will start my talk. And feel free to stop me when my time is ended and if I exceed uh, the 15, 20 minutes allowed. So, Thank you. I am glad and honored to be the first talk, the first speaker for today, and my talk will be devoted to user centered analysis of the usability of open government data portal. And this study is my independent study, by which I mean that it is non funded at the moment, and it is based on my enthusiasm. And um, it also means that uh, it is a kind of my hobby and what I do uh, in my or instead of my leisure time. So. Let me start with a brief uh, overview of the rationale for the study. First of all, it is not a secret that open government data today are considered as one of the most influential tools for reducing corruption or increasing transparency, establishing uh, a channel between government and user, and reaching creative solutions that create added value for society if uh, they are based on the uh, open data. However, in order to make this uh, goals achieved, it is important to establish a channel between users and open government data. It is important and crucial to establish and to develop some ecosystem consisting of users of open government data and some uh, tool which uh, facilitates uh, this interaction. And this tool or this uh, part of this ecosystem is an open government data portal. Um, therefore, nowadays, very uh, many countries develop their own uh, open government data portal. However, despite this fact, they receive a great deal of criticism from both society and technical experts. Therefore, the aim of my study was to find the main challenges that could negatively impact users' experience through an analysis of usability of 41 open data portals, mainly taking a look on the European um, open data portals, but supplying this list with uh, some additional portals from other continents as well. Uh, and in order to achieve this uh, end, to achieve this goal, it was decided to apply on them a unified methodology uh, to allow uh, to ensure the possibility to perform their comparative analysis. Uh, of course, it should be also mentioned that some indexes and benchmarks on open data portals exist. And here is one of the most uh, popular examples uh, it is an assessment of the maturity of open data portals according to European Data Portal, where European Data Portal is one of the greatest consortiums to um, assess open government data initiatives of different countries, more, uh, more precisely uh, European countries uh, and you, uh, 
European Union 37 plus. Uh, so it kind of 32 countries are tested uh, each year. And here you can see some summary where I have uh, not only provided some uh, numbers uh, how good enough or not really good enough uh, in the certain year was the portal of a certain country, but also how it is developed or degraded during last year. And here you can see that our country, Latvia, is ranked as 11 in 2019. And in addition, it is one of the sole countries who develops from one year to another. And considering that our open data portal is new enough, it was established and developed in 2017. Therefore, you can see that in 16, uh, we were on the very low position. And from this time where our, our portal was launched, our result improves from one year to another. Uh, however, what is the weakness of this uh, index of this benchmark? First of all, it is not looking on the very specific uh, features and uh, functionalities of open data portals. And secondly, it, it does not consider user perspective because all this data are collected from open data holders so it also means that this result cannot be considered as objective enough. And it was a reason to uh, carry out another uh, study because uh, after the very in-depth um, analysis of the literature and the state of the art, it was concluded that existing studies mainly cover their own national open government data initiatives and portals. And in most cases, it points to the assessment of uh, portals uh, assessing them from very specific perspectives, such as data functionality and features, particularly related to uh, main, um, main properties of the portals, stakeholder participation and feedback, and the relevance of the data set of a portal, for instance, to the five star classification or something like that. In addition, they also focus mainly on data delivery and the data environment and lack a user perspective. Therefore, it was at least to avoid while developing my study. And here are a few key points on the study I have carried out in the last year. First of all, uh, 41 national open data portal was selected to carry out a comparative analysis uh, to perform a user-centered uh, analysis because uh, if we speak about the channel between user and open government, uh, open government data portal, it is clear that uh, user should be involved and user perspective should be considered. And 40 participants with IT background uh, were selected. Uh, of course, uh, very uh, specific experimental design properties and points uh, were also taken into account, such as randomized sequence, uh, what is called learning effect or something like that. So the stimuli, and by the stimuli, I mean uh, the sequence of open data portals to be assessed by every participant, they were randomized. Uh, and to create, to establish a common overview of the framework to be applied, we had a lecture uh, where I have explained uh, thoroughly and compressively uh, what every aspect we will cover a bit later means and how to assess it and so on. And this was followed uh, by a question answer session to uh, ensure that every participant understands uh, one and the same aspect in one and the same manner. And then, um, the unified framework was applied. Here you can see some information about this framework, but I won't go into the uh, bit into detail, uh, but just in a very few words. First of all, it is usability relation framework developed by Cheek uh, researchers. And this evaluation framework was supplied with some additional requirements. Uh, in the case, I was, sure, I was pretty sure that uh, some very crucial aspects uh, are missing from this framework. Uh, but the main point of this framework is to assess uh, each and every portal from the perspective of three categories, more precisely data specification, data set feedback, and data set request. And they are subdivided into 14 aspects. Uh, we will cover these aspects very briefly, just in a few seconds. And every of these aspects and every of these categories were assessed by participants from his own perspective using three point weighted scales from one not fulfilled to three fulfilled and uh, two points were assessed uh, by two points were assessed uh, some certain aspects if uh, this particular aspect is just partly covered. Um, so here you can also see a list of, of statements why this approach is better um, comparing with some alternatives. 
But the main point is that, first of all, it considers a user perspective, and it was crucial, and reflects all the functionality of the portal and typical tasks normally performed by users. So as a result, as I have mentioned, I had 41 national open data portals selected and 40 participants engaged. And as a result, it means that I have obtained uh, more than one and a half thousand protocols, which were further analyzed to, uh, to establish some trends, some tendencies. In addition, here I should mention that these additional requirements mentioned previously uh, mainly are related to the presence of use case, multilingualism, and some other features uh, which have not, uh, have not been covered in this framework. But let us go a bit further. As I have mentioned, uh, these three categories, open data specification, feedback, and request, were also subdivided into 14 aspects because it is not enough just to assess specification, feedback, and request, because they are very general, too general. Uh, therefore, here is a list of aspects, such as uh, specification is divided in the description of data set, where, whether it is present and whether it is uh, detailed enough, publisher of data set, thematic categories and text, whether they exist and whether they are distinguished between themselves, release date and up-to-date, whether they are present and whether they are qualitative enough, machine readability of open data set provided, open data license, whether it exists, whether it is stated, whether it is applicable for all the data sets or just on part of them and so on, and what is uh, a kind of this open data license, uh, whether it is uh, possible to visualize uh, the certain open data, data, open data set and to gain some statistics on them. Um, while the second category, open data set feedback, was further divided into documentation tutorials, whether they are present and whether they are detailed enough, forum and contact form, user rating, comments, and social media and sharing. Uh, so basically, whether it, is, uh, whether it is possible to interact with open data portal, with open data publisher, and uh, to establish an interaction between different users of the same portal. And open data request category was um, divided into request form, whether it exists, list of requests, whether it is possible to obtain the full list of requests uh, requested by other users as well, and involvement in the process uh, by which is meant uh, whether it is possible to track the state of the current uh, request. So this was the main, um, the main points of this framework. And then, Likert scale was used by every participant to assess every of these aspects. And here we can see a summary of protocols obtained, uh, where once again, each aspect could be, and each category as a result could be assessed from one to three points, where three points means that uh, portal is competitive enough. And here, uh, the higher its point, uh, the better, of course. Uh, and in green color, you can see uh, those portals, those countries which portals are competitive in specific category in this case. And so uh, these countries, uh, this also means that could be considered as an example by less competitive countries. Uh, less competitive countries uh, have scored in red. It means that certain category is a very of very low quality, it is very weak result, and improvement must take place. And it could be worth to take a look at leaders who are in green. Here you can see also the total numbers, and you can see uh, that just a very limited, more precisely, just five countries are competitive enough if we take a look on the overall results. However, we can also take a look that while these countries are competitive enough and uh, their uh, rates are in green, so it means that the result is pretty good, if we take a look on the specific, on the certain category, not necessarily uh, all these countries have uh, quite high results in every of these categories. So it is important to take a look deeper uh, on every category and not only category, but also aspect. And to the last point regarding this table um, is related to languages. Here, just very briefly, uh, here is provided a number of languages uh, and a list of languages in which the interface of the particular portal is available. And as you can see, there are some cases where only an English portal is available. However, there are also cases where more than one uh, language is supported. For our country, as you can see, Latin and English is provided. However, um, the long list of these um, uh, of different languages 
not necessarily means that all the portal is available in this language particular because uh, it is very uh, popular trend where just general some blocks are translated into this specific uh, particular language. However, every data set and description of data set is still in the main language. For instance, for our country, it would be Latin, while some headers and so on uh, are translated in English. If we uh, choose an English language, um, the majority of information of the data are provided only in Latin. And here you can see also the continu continuation of this table because as you have mentioned, I have assessed 41 portal, uh, but nothing really interesting here. Just we can see that uh, there are pretty much countries who have uh, this course in red. But why I think that this table is not of uh, great interest because here we will have some visualizations which will uh, provide to us more detail on this. So first of all, here you can see the red by category. If we speak about categories, once again, open data specification, open data set feedback, and open data set request, as we can see, the first category, the average rating by country for all these 41 countries is the best for the first category. For, uh, it means that data set specification and all the criteria um, that belongs to this category were pretty good. Uh, then the second position belongs to the second category, more precisely open data set feedback, and the worst scores are for the uh, last one, and this is the uh, open data set request. It should be mentioned that these uh, very low results could be explained pretty easily by the fact that very many countries don't have this opportunity at all. So it doesn't mean that it is not uh, very high quality or something like that, but just because uh, for some countries it is not the case, they just don't have any, such an accessibility. Uh, here we can also take a look on the latest results in the scope uh, of this study. And as we can see, uh, here arrow depicts uh, on them some trends comparing with average results. And here we can see that for feedback and request, our average results are better uh, comparing with average results. Uh, however, for specification, we are not so good as average result for 41, con uh, 41 country yet. And here, one more interesting point is related to the fact that the weakest category for us is a feedback. So the main uh, point for open government data portals to establish some channel between uh, open data users and open data publishers and government is not of very high quality. Well, it is better in comparison with uh, average results, but still not really good in among uh, three assets it is the weakest for us. Uh, here we can also see some visualizations in the scope of different countries. So in the scope of 41 country, and here we can also understand which countries were successful enough and who is better in comparison with our country, for instance, with our portal more critically. Here we can see that while specification is not really bad for us, there are pretty much countries who are a bit better in this aspect. And here we can also obtain some information on what could be those portals who can serve as an example for us. So to understand what are the key factor impacting uh, the, the competitiveness of this aspect, of this category, I'm sorry. Um, in blue color, here are leaders in red, uh, very weak results. Here we can see that we are in the gray zone, so not, not too uh, bad enough. However, we, uh, it could be better. In the scope of open data set feedback, here you can see that in general, if we take a look on these colors, um, this category is challenging for many countries, including Latvia. However, one more point here is that uh, the number of leaders and the number of great bars is pretty low. So it's not so bad result for Latvia, for instance. But one more interesting point is related to Romania here, because while Romania for almost every aspect and category is the worst among uh, 41 countries analyzed uh, in data set feedback, it is one of the best ones. So it is pretty interesting in the scope of general indexes available and benchmarks uh, which were available before the study because uh, then when we take a look, Romania is one of the worst ones. However, if we take a look into more detail on some aspects, 
it is not the case because in some aspects it is competitive enough. So it is some a kind of interesting observation. And for the last point, open data request, here we can see that while we are still in the red zone, uh, despite this fact, we are close enough to the leader. And this is... I'm uh, sorry, Anastasia, we are running out of time, but could oh, you... Oh, yes, sorry. Summarize Two more slides. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm uh, sorry to so, interrupt you. Yes, uh, so one, one minute more. Uh, here you can see also a brief summary on this aspect with the list of countries who are better uh, in the scope of particular aspects. And you can see that Latvia appears at least in one aspect, which is a very positive sign. However, if we take a look on the positions in scope of categories, we can see that we are in the red zone in two out of three positions. And also by the aspects, we can also see that while we are successive enough and competitive enough in three aspects, there are also some red uh, zones for us. So here you can also see some comparisons by aspect, but I don't have enough time. So just a few very general conclusions. First of all, uh, as it appears uh, after the analysis, four out of five weakest aspects uh, for all the portals are related to cooperation between data consumers. And this is pretty strange because it is one of the main aims and goals of open government data portal. But still, for the most countries, it is a very huge problem. And a total of seven aspects related to cooperation and feedback, only four countries are competitive enough. And here you can see also a list, Spain, Canada, Cyprus, and Russia. So six countries are just, just at the end of the list. Uh, here are also a few more positive examples, but they are closely related to cooperation and feedback, so I will skip them. Uh, multilingualism and use cases, which is a huge problem for Latvia, but not for other countries, because uh, 30 out of uh, 41 open data portals in life provide showcases. But I hope that this problem will be easily uh, solved in the near future, because my conversation with Ministry, who is the developer of our data portal, uh, has promised that they will solve this issue in the near future. And so for the results, um, it is a kind of summary of uh, my achievements uh, in this study uh, for the last year. And here you can see some references to the studies where to obtain this uh, information. And also a data set used to perform this analysis to carry out. It is uh, freely available and you can use it uh, for your purposes and to make some new, uh, some new analysis. You can also uh, gain some information on left and open data portal from my article or from informative reports published by Letta. And you can also take it, uh, take a look on the uh, new one study on timeliness of open data and open government data portal, which was a uh, kind of uh, first uh, studies on the pandemic related open data in the world. And now this is continued by another company. So thank you and sorry for being too long. Thank you so much, Anastasia. It was very fascinating and an interesting and timely presentation. So we are running out of time, uh, which means that I would recommend, I would suggest that if there are any questions and any comments, please uh, uh, drop a line uh, in the chat and uh, Anastasia could uh, either uh, respond that way or also you could also um, uh, send a message uh, directly and, and um, uh, communicate by, by email. So we are out of time. So thanks a lot again. And um, we are proceeding to the next uh, presentation of our today's session uh, by Aisha Tuzla from um, uh, Faculty of Computing, also our lab, and also uh, ELADA European Consortium uh, on um, uh, Early Language Acquisition. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased to give the floor to Aisha. We'll talk about the uh, digital learning tool used during COVID-19 uh, in Latvia. So thank you, Yuris, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me OK? We do. We can. Perfect. Can you see my slides? Yes. Do they progress? I hope so. If not, please let me know if my um, if you only see the first slide and they don't progress. And if I don't hear anything, I will just assume that it's okay. So hello everyone, and welcome to this uh, presentation about digital learning 
tool used during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I will present to you um, today's survey results about how Latvian students experience this time of uh, distance learning. So my name is Aisha, and uh, let's uh, continue with an overview of this presentation. So I will start with uh, explaining a bit the aims of this research and the context. Then um, I will describe um, the survey, what interested us, how the survey was designed, how it was structured. And then we'll um, details about sampling strategy and um, resulting sample composition um, will follow. After that, the heart of this presentation, um, a selection of results of the survey, as we have a lot of data and there's a lot of things uh, still to be discovered. I will select them. Uh, some of the important findings so far, and then we'll also present preliminary conclusions and an outlook. So here we see uh, a bit the context of the research and the, where this research, research is situated. As was said um, already before, this research is part of a Marie Skodowska Career Action Innovative Training Network named Early Language Development in the Digital Age, or short ILADA, and the project here in Latvia is named Usage Analysis of Digital and Analog Learning Materials. And um, I started being involved in this uh, project together with Jurgis and a lot of other colleagues um, in September. And I was thinking that in the last, um, in the year 2020, for the first time, in our lives and in a lot of learners lives we all um all of us who um, uh, learn we started using digital learning tools to do so due to the pandemic situation so it became somewhat of a daily routine so i wanted um, to use the moment and find out a bit more about um, how these um, digital learning tools are used what kind of features they have because I thought it might yield interesting insights for um, the fields of education science and as we try to be innovative here, also possibly um, for the instructional design of digital learning tools in the future. So, and um, when I started in autumn 2020, it was, um, you could say, a bit the calm before the storm, meaning the second wave. So while developing uh, this questionnaire, um, it all of a sudden became very timely um, and relevant and we could collect data live, let's say, because most of the schools and universities shifted to online learning. And now before we jump really into the survey, um, I wanted to mirror a bit this overload of logos, so I will also add a bit more text here and another logo. <laughs> Okay, so to the online questionnaires, um, the surveys, um, there were um, different surveys designed for um, different groups um, involved in education, namely young pupils, pupils grades 7 to 12, as well as their teachers and parents, um, and also university students. So, and as mentioned before, the interest um, was uh, to find out more about use, meaning frequency of use, occasion of use, context of use. Um, as well as features, meaning um, features of digital learning tool, meaning what can these learning tools do, what features are used by, um, by um, these different groups, and also um, we wanted to know a bit more about the acceptance, meaning how are advantages and disadvantages perceived, and um, how is the overall satisfaction with the digital learning tool use during distance learning in the course of the COVID-19 pandemic um, in Latvia. So just um, a quick definition. So for the scope of this research, digital learning tools um, really um, encompass all digital tools which are used for the purpose of learning. So it's a very inclusive definition of it. So they also in, um, um, include tools which are designed for a different purpose, uh, maybe originally. And um, they also, in, um, what is also meant is that not only uh, online tools are meant by this definition, but digital tools in general, as for instance, also an offline um, e-book um, e reader, for instance. 
Good. The survey um, consisted of uh, a variety of questions and the answer options were either discrete answer options as for instance for frequency of use, um, but most of the questions the, um, the answer option was a quasi-continuous scale where the respondents um, could um, place a slider on a value um, and having two anchor points on the left hand side um, saying uh, completely disagreeing and on the right hand side completely agreeing. So and the underlying scale was a quasi-continuous scale, but we will see a bit later how this concretely looked like. So today uh, we will be focusing on student survey. So let's just jump into it. Our sampling strategy was the following. Um, we distributed the links uh, via different contact points at different faculties of the University of Latvia in order to get a representative um, sample um, with students of a lot of uh, study fields. Um, and the data were collected last year between uh, November 17th and uh, December 13th. The sample that resulted consists of 104 university students in Latvia, of which were 58% female, 41% male, and 1% indicated other as their gender. The mean age in our sample is 23.21, uh, so 23 years old in other words, but around one third um, uh, of the sample is 19 years old. It comes as not a big surprise um, that 87% of our sample studies at bachelor level and merely 8% um, at master level, whereas the rest could not be categorized, the, the remaining rest here is not categorized in these um, two categories and um, either because they study medicine or because they um, have, they are in, uh, enrolled in a professional higher education degree. And here in this next figure, we see a bit the fields of study um, of our respondents. And we see that the majority um, of the respondents uh, study natural and life sciences, followed by mathematics and pedagogy. So here we see the sample that, um, that we have is biased towards, uh, towards students of bachelor level and as well of uh, uh, as of students of natural and life sciences, engineering and computing sciences, which here in our sample make up 71% of the sample, whereas in the general student population in Latvia, they constitute merely 9%. So we could say strongly biased towards these study fields. So let's look, Let's jump right into the results and look at general experience or overall um, satisfaction with the distance learning scheme. And here we see also one example of this slider with the two anchor points and um, very unsatisfied on the left hand side and very satisfied on the right hand side. Um, and we also see here additionally put by me the, um, the underlying scale um, of this um, slider. So, and the mean value of overall experience uh, with distance learning um, was a bit over 50, so hinting towards an only weak positive perception. And in students of life sciences, um, this value was even a bit higher, whereas it was lowest for mathematics students. So, and here the survey started with a question about notice change of behavior of the respondents and they were asked um, if they compared their state of mind or behavior to the beginning of the school year when classes were presential um, if they noticed one of these uh, following stated changes of behavior and as we can clearly see um, already here in this violin plots which shows the distribution of value zero mean completely disagreeing and 100 being completely agreeing. Um, we can see already that the most agreed on statements here in this section are that it's harder to focus um, on the task at hand at home as well as that they felt less motivated or engaged. For the other sections, um, the results are not as conclusive as for instance we can see here with the uh, um, time management as well as uh, felt stress where we see a huge um, dispersion, where we see big dispersion of the data, 
Um, but what, what we can also see is that there is a weak um, tendency of disagreeing with being uh, more stressed and with managing time worse than at regular classes. So due to time constraints, I will um, go to the next slide, which tells us a bit about how these changes of behavior or state of mind are related to the overall experience uh, um, of the distance learning scheme. And here we can see that higher ratings of overall satisfaction are um, um, associated with better time management, better focus, and higher motivation and, and engagement, which we can see here by the positive and rather strong correlations. Um, lower ratings, however, however, are associated with worse time management and uh, being less motivated and engaged than in regular classes at university. So even though we couldn't really see, um, uh, it was not straightforward if students manage time better or if they manage uh, time worse, we can see that those students who manage time worse, um, that they are we could say that it's likely impacting their overall perception of the distance learning scheme. So let's look at digital learning tool use. And here we have a color coded graphics with the red color palette um, indicating a seldom uh, use or even saying that um, this respondent never, or the respondents never used them, uh, these methods of digital learning, and the violet color palette indicating rather frequent use, uh, meaning at least one time per week. And we can see, not surprisingly, that live online teaching is the most commonly used method for Latvian students, followed by social media for learning, um, and um, by videos of lectures, meaning recorded videos of lectures of university professors. Um, interestingly, learning platforms like Moodle are not as widely used. And also interestingly, the most frequently used tool with 35% uh, of students using it daily are social media for learning purposes. Uh, and here specifically WhatsApp. If we compare this to last year, and we, we can see here clearly due to the color coding that um, uh, the picture was a very different one before spring 2020, meaning before the time of the first distance learning scheme um, as compared to this year. What is not surprising, but still um, can be pointed out here is that the most common methods right now were not common at all before spring 2020. But what, however, is a bit surprising is that um, online learning materials here provided by educational websites, for instance, were also uh, not used by the majority of students uh, before um, spring 2020 and now are rather frequently used. And what we can also see is that in basically all sections, um, there was an increase in digital learning tool use. So let's look a bit closer at these uh, tools in use. Here is a selection of features um, and they were selected according to agreement with it, uh, with the statement. We have um, again violin plots here and we can see that the most agreed on statements which are presented here are that the tools which are used enabled to share files as well as uh, that they foster collaboration. So there we have two features which are somehow connected with uh, interactiveness, with communication, with collaboration, um, which these uh, tools uh, comprised. However, as we can see in the fourth violin plot, um, the tools do not make um, this communication that they provide easier. This is a statement that students did not agree on. Um, or rather not agree on, um, to be more precise. So, and um, then you can see also some statements about or agreement values uh, in terms of enjoyment of using the tools and very dispersed the data here. Um, 
um, when it comes to agreement to the statement that it's more useful to learn topics with the digital learning tools rather than with traditional uh, methods at university. So which hints um, towards uh, very diverging perceptions of this distant learning uh, scheme and um, the learning tool uh, learning tools in use, which I can um, 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 I think we can say in general about um, all of these uh, features that are presented here that the data are quite dispersed. So what do students need that they did not have available to them um, during this time of distance learning? Uh, and I'm sorry for the um, for the bad visibility of the last violin. You see, I, I changed the color scheme a bit, but I'm not sure if this one really works better. But anyways, I hope you can um, make it out if you focus on it. Um, and here we can see that in terms of needs of students, so what did the students need that was not um, available to them, that the most uh, agreed on statements are for one. Uh, better communication with university professors and lecturers and um, here also very apparent uh, clear communication about structure and um, learning goals. So what do we learn from this? Um, we learned that um, not surprisingly digital learning tool use has increased for students in Latvia uh, and this is also true for the other groups that I mentioned namely um, pupils and teachers. Uh, students, as well as pupils and teachers, um, additionally stated that their digital skills improved during the times of distance learning. And this is seen as an advantage um, by parents. Uh, and some teachers um, do not only see it as an advantage, but also an opportunity. I see that I'm almost running out of time but I will make it, it's just half a minute to one minute um, left. Yes, and this uh, and uh, teachers see this additionally as an opportunity of these times, which also goes well together with their agreement to the statement of how important uh, digital uh, learning tools will be for the education um, of pupils in the future. And there they place the si slider on values of um, around um, like mean values of 80 out of 100. So they think it is very important. Um, so digital learning tools will be very important in the future. And this is also um, comparable to what students and pupils say. So another thing that we learned um, is that communication is quintessential for successful distance learning and uh, not only among students, um, which we saw which we saw when we looked at the tool use, um, but also when we look when we're looking at the needs, um, communication with lecturers and institutions is um, very important. So, and now just one sentence uh, to to the outlook. We also collected qualitative um, uh, data in the surveys as well as qualitative interviews. Uh, in the course of this research, and this is to be further analyzed. Um, so thank you for your attentions, for your attention, and um, I would be happy to answer any questions that might appear. Thanks, Aisha. Thanks a lot. So we have time for a brief uh, question or comment or whatever to add or clarify. Are there any questions, any, any issues to be clarified? Well, I have a question. If there are no, uh, no uh, questions, I have a, a brief uh, uh, question remark. What do you think, um, isn't it a problem uh, with the uh, online learning that um, most of the tools are not very friendly for uh, sharing uh, knowledge and supporting collaboration. Because as, as far as I see from those data, I think most of the students enjoy or find uh, the collaboration or sharing knowledge is crucial. So what would you say? Yeah, I, I would um, agree to this statement definitely. And we saw in the data that um, uh, students do communicate. It's very important for learning, but they do not communicate it uh, 
communicate with those tools that um, they use for learning in the university setting. So they have one tool that they uh, use for learning, but then they go to a different tool to have this community, um, communicative aspect uh, covered. So yes, definitely. That's, I think, one of the biggest learnings here. Mm. That it's important, but underserved, let's say. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, if there are no other short remarks or questions, then thanks a lot, Aisha. It was really uh, wonderful uh, and um, gives a glimpse into uh, a, a larger project that is running uh, running uh, at the uh, University of Latvia and also other universities currently in Europe. Thanks a lot. And now we are moving to our third um, uh, report in our today's um, uh, 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 session um, and um, uh, I'm, I'm uh, delighted to uh, in, in introduce uh, Maya Karl and Mati Svigters, uh, Maya from the University of Latvia Faculty of Computing and Mati is from the University of Tokyo, uh, um, presenting a talk on tracing sentiment changes in food tweets, which sort of interrelates to some of the uh, presentations later. Your, the floor is yours, Maya. Yes, thank you. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, I will be presenting, but um, also Matis is here, so he will be able to uh, comment and help in case of something. Uh, my question is, do you see a full uh, screen? Uh, or Yes, we do. we do. Everything fine with the presentation. Good. So I'll be talking about uh, tracing sentiment changes in food tweets. Uh, and let me start uh, with a question. Uh, why or the context? So the changing nature of humans from hunter gatherers to super consumers uh, has led uh, to the public health issues. So we have uh, high numbers of obesity, type two diabetes, cardiovascular diseases. And these diseases are um, non-communicable diseases, they are lifestyle-induced diseases. And um, food uh, plays a very important role in this uh, type of uh, illnesses. Whereas the food choice and the way people eat is um, not that a simple question that the research community cannot uh, really provide very um, specific and um, how to say efficient measures for, for policy makers because the policies have not really succeeded so far in decreasing those numbers. But we can also see if we look at the digital media that uh, food related hedonism is growing and we know something about the food, but mostly the research has focused on corrective aspects of the food. Those are better documented and we don't uh, have that much of research done that would say something about the positive human and food relationships. Uh, we live in the times of this new reality. If before, just a couple of decades ago, we were asking how many calories and how many people can we feed with those calories, then today's reality is quite different. More and more complex uh, questions are asked about the food. How many CO2 emissions does the food produce? Is it locally produced? Uh, how many calories, vitamins? Is it appropriate for my personalized health uh, issues? So uh, we are living in the reality or the new normal is to have abundant questions about the food. And this we can also see in uh, social media in our other arenas. Why is it important to, to research uh, sentiment and what can the sentiment reveal uh, of the social networks and particularly Twitter as you will see later. Uh, first of all, through sentiments uh, analysis, we can uh, trace interesting multi-sensory aspects. So we can see what aspects people actually talk about when they talk about food. Do they talk about smell, taste, temperature, for example? Uh, do they talk about the food as healthy or tasty? What are specific attitudes uh, towards particular foods? And many other aspects. So this is something we can trace the mood, uh, time, uh, dynamics, and other, whatever you can imagine. 
this work is very much uh, possible due to a fantastic resource we have, and that's thanks to Matis. Uh, mainly, this is Latvian Twitter Eater Corpus. And this Latvian Twitter Eater Corpus is collected over nine years, uh, following 363 eating-related keywords in Latvian language. So it's unique Latvian language data corpus. Uh, has a total size more than 2 million tweets, almost 170,000 users, and has a sentiment annotated subset of approximately 6,000 tweets. So this is quite profound and quite a good base uh, to, to, to base our analysis on. So how do we determine sentiment? <clears throat> uh, there's a, a trained classifier, uh, there is many uh, experts uh, or colleagues from Till that have contributed to that. And as you can see, uh, there's uh, more than 17,000 tweets for training, 1,000 for development, and uh, more than 700 for evaluation. And in fact, the classifier is working very well. It's working better than the human classifier at this moment. Uh, it is interesting that there is not such a high agreement among right now eight evaluators that we had uh, currently already more eight and counting. The agreement is uh, just 71.67%. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, the model is doing better in terms of precision than the average evaluator's precision. But let me illustrate why, and here I will talk a little bit, maybe in Latvian for one minute. Uh, it's quite difficult to determine sentiment of selected tweets and uh, consider those. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting that Sorry for Latvian <laughs> inter intermezzo. Let's move on to our results. So uh, we looked at specific issues of smell, taste, and temperature. And uh, let me draw your attention to the upper left corner table, which shows a, a general sentiment uh, Mm, uh, of food, uh, and this is really interesting and fascinating result that we see that at the beginning of Twitter, when it was more popular and the Instagram didn't take over the users, Twitter was very, very positive. The green line is the positive sentiment. The gray line is a neutral and the red line is a negative. But we see a very a clear shift uh, around 2015, when probably Instagram came and took away all the positive notions from Twitter, and it has uh, gradually become somewhat like a complaint book, because we see a gradual but steady rise of negative sentiments in Twitter, uh, quite a con uh, constant number of positive sentiments, and also rising um, number of neutral sentiments and usually these neutral sentiment tweets are those which is like maybe automated content like lunch offer of today or something like that that you see that it's more like a market uh, related not a human expression of uh, their experience uh, then if we look to the next table to the right so the right upper corner it's about the smell and it was quite interesting to look at this uh, smell related uh, sentiment because, in fact, we don't talk much about smell. Uh, it's one of the least discussed areas, <laughs> even in the food uh, uh, tweets, despite the fact that smell uh, plays such an important role in consuming food. And uh, there we can see um, dominating the positive sentiment and also quite uh, um, intensive negative sentiment, but very little neutral sentiment. So if we talk in those rare occasions about smell, then we are um, clearly positive or negative, but not neutral. 
Then if we turn to this uh, table, uh, lower left corner, this is the temperature related to sentiment analysis. And this is quite the opposite uh, of um, the smell. We see a lot of uh, neutral temperature tweets with some kind of regularity or seasonality and a few positive and negative uh, tweets. We were able to trace uh, appearance of cold soup, seasonality, and uh, the relation of temperature tweets there. So it's related to national cuisine somewhat uh, in terms, at least in Latvian Eater uh, Twitter corpus. And the taste, uh, taste as, we, as I already talked about this general, um, sentiments, we see also that uh, initially, in initial, initial years of Twitter, the, there was lots of positive uh, sentiment about taste. Uh, it's still, uh, positive is still okay, but this neutral is uh, rising sharply, and also the negative uh, sentiment is rising steadily. Uh, we uh, carried out a specific uh, focus on how people talk about tasty or healthy food. And we found out that uh, people do discuss uh, tasty food, that it's tasty in terms of taste, temperature, and smell, but very few uh, uh, reference to healthy. And, and uh, this is in general somewhat uh, an issue to discuss that people talk about uh, uh, tastiness, but they don't talk that much about healthiness. And we, according to the theory, these two are somewhat mutually exclusive because if you have a notion that something is healthy, like for example, reduced fat label for the chocolate, that automatically creates a sense that this chocolate is less tasty. So uh, this is also something that we followed uh, here in the Twitter analysis. Uh, all in all, we have to say that, uh, as I just illustrated, that language of food has power to affect food choices, as I uh, talked about these healthy or tasty issues. And uh, we also can see that some aspects uh, have more neutrality and some are more positive or negative. And um, that we don't really find much joy or much information about uh, healthy food. We talk mainly about tasty food. Our next uh, focus was, uh, we wanted to look at the sentiment related to meat. As I already introduced uh, to you, there is big discussion of CO2 emissions that the food creates and uh, producing meat is one of the CO2 most intensive uh, industries. So um, the World Health Organization and other institutions are inviting people to eat less meat for the sake of planetary health. So uh, do we see some kind of uh, echoes of this invitation in our Twitter uh, eater uh, sentiments? Uh, we can see that uh, the table to the left, uh, we can see that the negative sentiments have uh, slowly, gradually overgrown the positive sentiments, but we still find uh, much of neutral uh, sentiment tweets. And, uh, and to the right, uh, also we can see that uh, negative uh, sentiments are catching up uh, and the neutral are also increasing while the positive are decreasing uh, comparatively. And if you look at specific uh, meat products uh, like beef, uh, the red meat, which is especially suggested to avoid, or chicken and uh, pork, then uh, also we can uh, well, the we can see that uh, negative uh, sentiments in general are growing. Uh, they are overgrowing the positive sentiments, but we see like a very big uh, um, growth of these uh, negative, uh, neutral sentiments, which we explain uh, intuitively with uh, content that is uh, created automatically, like these lunch offers or just uh, general informative tweets, not necessarily created by humans. 
So uh, the conclusions are that large-scale social network data can be helpful for better understanding human and food relationships. Um, and it can also help to form strategies and tactics for nudging for healthier lifestyles, both for human and for planet. And um, this uh, research on Twitter is just a small uh, part that we can do when we research social media. It might be that the scene in Instagram is very different in terms of food or the positive, neutral and negative sentiments there. What is, however, interesting is that this, uh, at least in Twitter, the negative sentiment has tendency to rise and, uh, to, and, uh, and the neutral sentiments also increase, but the positive sentiments are not uh, anymore that dominating. And uh, neutrality has, we were also able to notice that neutrality in tweet uh, sentiments has decreased with the beginning of the pandemic. So the pandemic has made us uh, less neutral. Um, what is it for this in the future? It's very clear that social media as a platform will continue to exist. It will be a place where the foodies will interact. Everybody will be able to become a celebrity chef, share their recipes, lifestyle information, personalized kind of uh, models of eating and living. And it's clear that we are living in the world where there's increasing amount of this kind of data. And the question is how, how do we utilize these data and are we actually uh, utilizing them sufficiently so that we can um, help both planet and people. And just the last uh, slide, uh, since we had a Valentine's Day recently, I thought I would just give a quick uh, look into this book, The Language of Food, that has inspired us a lot. It's interesting that the word love uh, was used to, only since uh, 1800s, the word love was used to describe inanimate objects like food. So before that, we didn't use the word love to describe food. And what the other interesting aspects is that in our language, we are more specific in describing negative experiences. But about positive experiences, we would just say, well, that was great, or it was tasty, or wow, delicious. But if we would describe uh, our negative experience, we would be much more eloquent in our description. So uh, this is another kind of uh, thing to take into account when analyzing social media. What, what is the language of food and how we are limited or enabled by language when talking about food. So thank you. I will stop here. Thanks a lot, Maya. That was uh, awesome. Uh, any questions, comments? We have a couple of minutes time for uh, questioning, commenting, uh, discussing. While colleagues are uh, thinking of a question, I have a question. Um, if you think of the whole dynamics of sentiment assignment, what would be the main conclusion that you and, uh, and, and uh, Matis would like to uh, generalize from, from this? Matis, would you like to <laughs> come on the stage? Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes. uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, well, the question was, um, I mean, um, uh, you have the sentiment analysis and the sort of um, uh, uh, longitudinal uh, perspective. So my question was, what does this, this the dynamics of sentiment assignment show? What would you say? What is the generalization? So, I mean, any, any thoughts about this? Well, I think Maya already pointed this out that we're becoming more polarized on the internet. Uh, well, although both the neutral and positive negative ones were growing, but well, yeah, it seemed that uh, the, the positive and negative ones were growing faster than the neutral ones. So that would yeah. maybe indicate something bad. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I think so as well. But uh, this is actually a finding that, uh, uh, as Matis uh, said, we are more polarized. Mm -hmm. But also that in general there is this content that we can uh, uh, assign as neutral. So it means that we are much uh, better aware of what exactly is this uh, social network Twitter consisting of, in a way, the structure of these uh, different uh, tweet types. Okay, thanks. So any other um, short questions or remarks or anything to add or clarify with my and uh, Mati's? Do you consider to uh, explore sentiment in a more fine-grained uh, way because you have uh, only positive, negative, and that's basically all. I mean, you have uh, you can have a variety of, uh, of um, options. So uh, have you considering to do more in detail analysis of that? Uh, it was already, it's already so difficult to have this agreement of what is positive, neut neutral and negative because everyone reads these very, you know, ambivalent tweets differently. So we haven't thought about it, but maybe you can, uh, what would you suggest to how could we increase uh, the gradation here? I don't have a, a straightforward answer, but perhaps it's worth considering and um, I mean, so in the human evaluations that we performed, several tweets were like, a couple of evaluators said that this is neutral, a couple said that this is positive because it looks like a joke, a couple said that it's negative because, well, even though it's a joke, it, it kind of in a, I don't know, almost a British humor with someone, at someone who's expense. So, well, at least one more category maybe would be like mixed mixed feelings in that one or I'm a joke sure be better than <laughs> uh, the neutral but well some more granularity yeah i think the humor humor or maybe also yeah there could be i also had a question from me when she was uh, also helping with um, tweet uh, um the sentiment uh, analysis uh, how to where the nost nostalgia goes yeah <laughs> then sucht auf deutsch or something you know is it positive is it uh, sad is it negative is it no it's certainly not neutral so yes there are more uh, options for gradation we can look into that yeah. okay well thanks a lot we are uh, we are finishing um... Uh, my and Madi's presentation, and uh, thanks to both um, uh, colleagues for, for that interesting, fascinating um, uh, work. And now the next uh, uh, talk, the next report in today's session is uh, by Agne Vintischer, uh, Lee Zarin, Anna Zaremba, Laura Keish, Jan Sardin, and myself. And the uh, topic is the um, impact of previous knowledge, emotions, and associations in cross-modal uh, uh, flavor perception on non-alcoholic beverages. So I'm giving the floor to Agnia. Hello, people. Uh, I'm going to present this aspect of our research, which is previous knowledge, emotions, and associations in cross-modal flavor perception of non-alcoholic beverages. Um, the other part will be presented by uh, your Slater. Um, so, um, give me a second. Yordi, can I? Is it okay if I change? This is not the right file. I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. One second. Uh, I might just share my screen. You can do that. I think. All right, um, please tell me if you can see everything, somebody? Yes, we can, yeah, sure. All right, so uh, I think we should start a little bit of a background about 
uh, sensory perception to get on the same page and exactly how that might relate with emotional processing and past experience and knowledge. Uh, so we constantly perceive uh, stimuli. Sens sensory information is constant and spontaneous. We have no say in that. So uh, it might feel be a, a little misleading that it might because it's in isolation, it's the objective. Um, but the reality is that, of course, it's limited by our, um, you know, architecture, by the fact that there's certain capacity to what, how much information we can perceive, and how much information we can attend to. So a good example for that is change blindness. Technically, you would think that if something is moving very quickly, you would immediately notice that because you know it's an evolutionary. Um, then you have to notice changes. Uh, and yet with change blindness, if you see, uh, we have uh, an example here, two pictures flickering one and the other, you wouldn't notice that uh, there's a branch up there. Then there's a person on the sidewalk that isn't on the other second picture. There's a crack in the um, um, ground that isn't in the second picture. There's a bolt missing, like a, like a nail from, it, in the second picture, so you wouldn't notice that. So clearly um, your perception of things is not just sensory information, it is also dictated by your attention. And what determines your attention is emotions and is your previous knowledge and what you should attend to. Um, this is probably obviously just only one of the ways how uh, we can relate these, these aspects. Um, and therefore, uh, when we speak about, in this case, um, sense of flavor, not sense, perception of flavor, it is not just taste, it is actually taste and smell and visual cues and affective states and certain, um, you know, past experiences. It's not an isolation. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, in, uh, in this wonderful paper by Shankar Levitin and Spence, um, they uh, explore how cognitive and um, contextual constraints may mediate color flavor interactions. And uh, they also emphasize uh, on the fact that um, many research that's been done in cross modality might be actually confounded by the fact that um, no, we are not accounting for the other factors and how much expectation and how much these cognitive higher order processes affect those results, which is why um, in our research, we, uh, you're just going to talk about, you know, color and flavor um, more directly, but we have to account for these factors as well in order to interpret the results uh, in a more realistic way. Maybe, maybe it still is enough, but we need to try to distinguish those both aspects. So what we did was we had three experiments. The first one was uh, online and we looked at um, how different colors, color beverages in glasses. And in the second one, it was also online. It was in bottles to see what uh, associative powers uh, might influence uh, perception of these participants. Maybe it's brand, maybe it's associations that they have with you know, the same colors or the shape anything at all. Um, and then ex in experiment three, we looked at, um, we, we actually, it was a crawl present um, experiment. So people actually tasted uh, drinks um, and then expressed uh, their, you know, associations that have um, occurred in the process. <clears throat> so I'm going to speak about these five points that these five, Test essentially that we did uh, specifically in terms of associations and emotions and all that all that jazz. Um, so the first one will be free association. So meaning um, the participants read online the the phrase flavor Latvian, and they have to um, in just by free association express what they what this reminds them of, and the same for qualities that a non-alcoholic beverage should have. Uh, then in the Test, tasting um, test. Uh, so there are going to be three associations. What is the association that they um, get as they are drinking this drink? And we're going to look at emotions um, in both and adjective pairs and preset associations. 
So let's start with free associations in the online test. Um, we can see that the flavor of Latvia for 39% um, is taste words, meaning sweet, sour, bitter. Those are the biggest ones we can, you know, imagine um, ourselves, you know, bitter, let's say, even root beer, sweet as well. Um, and then uh, uh, fruits and berries was, was the second biggest category, 34. Uh, apple, cranberry, black currant, quince, which black and currant and quince actually happened to be part of the drinks that they, um, in the third experiment, some participants tasted. And then generally above beverages, which is quass, birch water, milk, and then smaller um, categories later. Uh, as, uh, as for the associations with qualities of beverages, the majority um, thought that a beverage should be refreshing, which is 90%. I mean, there are synonyms in Latvian that are, mean the same thing in English, but, um, and then uh, they, uh, and 30% believe that the flavor, 12% believe that the flavor should be good. And there were taste words and just many different types of uh, categories that we could interpret differently, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, we can start with the tasting. We, uh, in the beginning, considered a couple of things. Um, firstly, each participant tasted both drinks. We had the uh, black currant and lavender, and then um, the roven and quince. And we wanted to see whether the difference, you know, maybe there's something relative going on. Maybe the difference of sequence might affect things. There was no significant difference, but uh, there's a tendency uh, to, uh, for the, uh, if you had the lavender drink, a second one, you might enjoy it more. Um, and there was no significant difference of pref preference of either drink. Um, there's a tendency for lavender as well. And overall ratings, um, people liked it more than they didn't like it. On average, of course, there's high variance. And they uh, found that the color was more suitable than it wasn't. Um, but it, of course, once again, variance. We also asked whether they're aware of this drink, because of course that those, if, if you already have pre-existing set of beliefs about this drink that might affect the results, the majority didn't. Um, a very small part did in 16% uh, in the tasting, which is for us more important. So when it comes to free association and tasting, they just throw out words that, you know, they, that come to their minds. 20% uh, thought that it was refreshing. 18% uh, had mixed feelings. There, it, there was either, it was something unexpected. Are they disappointed? Are there something different, interesting. Um, and then 12% was generally positive emotions and associations like calm and 11% uh, was flavorless, featureless, watery. There were some negative emotions and associations as well, 10%, which is a lot, which is all uh, nauseating. And uh, taste words, sour, bitter. If you had tasted them, you would agree. They were both sour and bitter carbonated and so on and so forth with smaller categories. Um, and then we did an emo oh, uh, emotion test for both. We did um, both for online and for tasting, we used the Swedish core effect scales. If you're not familiar with it, um, it's essentially uh, based on study uh, I've added um, it there under there. Um, Essentially, what they did was in multiple sets of studies, they narrowed down uh, to 12 subcategories of, um, you know, uh, emotion, um, dimensionality, direction to, to 12 um, that fully represent all the emotions that humans might go through. And there are four categories, balance, meaning uh, how positive, uh, how pleasant it is, and how unpleasant, and activation meaning how energetic and how unenergetic might be, and then there uh, the colors are corresponding with the uh, the lines, so you can see uh, what type of scale that is when you know um, participants an answered the questions. Um, so essentially, we found that um, there was no significant difference between online and tasting emotions, which is good for our results in a sense, because it means that they were equally emotional either way. Uh, so, yeah, but, um, but in the board interested um, 
uh, instance at scale, the uh, the tasting were more hum hum like there was less variation. It was ho more hum homogenous for the people who thought that it was slightly more interesting than not that than than boring. But that's that's essentially it. They did find either test. They felt the same way. Um, then we did adjective pairs, meaning, um, you know, there you can see it on the right side, there's cheap, expensive, cool, and warm. Um, and uh, we did, uh, we, we can consider this in particularly with um, the red drink and the yellow drink. Uh, the assumption is this. So if we compare the red online and the uh, kind of red, uh, tasting, then we can maybe compare these two values and see whether how they perceive it and how it actually tastes is any different. Um, so, of course, those colors are not the same, um, but we are assuming that there is a condition, condition uh, sense of similarity, so people might um, condition these responses on other drinks as well. Um, we can see in the results, which actually uh, works well with the previous um, presentation, we can see that um, that the untasty, tasty, the indigo, the, the purple color, it kind of corresponds, on average, of course, high variance, but it corresponds with increase. If, if something is less tasty, um, it is more fresh, healthy, and higher quality, um, as well as natural. What a sad world we live in. Um, but uh, but yes, so clearly th these data can be um, reproduced. So, um, and then we looked at preset associations, meaning that there was a list of associations. And this is this is the list um, that people had to pick out what what uh, makes sense to them in regards to these drinks. And when we uh, uh, look at yellow and quince, we in this case we look at. Um, um, yeah, we look at the uh, at the the online one. So they are just looking at the bottle. They're just looking at the color, and then they are looking. Uh, then then we're looking at um, the uh, the actual tasting test, and then we can see discrepancies. Where where does that color? Does that representation live live up to their expectations? So the blue ones are the constant ones. Um, both uh, the the online test and the tasting test showed that they are, that the drinks are considered um, aromatic and remind of summer and are refreshing. However, what that did increase for the particularly yellow quince drink uh, was that um, there was an increased sense of calm uh, and there was an increased sense of uh, disappointment. What decreased was attractiveness, how exotic it felt, how much it reminded of childhood, and how happy they felt. Um, then when it comes to the red lavender, again, you can see that the aromatic and summer and um, ref refreshness, ref how refreshing it is, remain the same. Whereas what increases is disappointment, how irritating it is, how unsafe it feels, and somehow that it feels more free. Whereas what decreases is, attractiveness, how exotic it is, that it's not as syrupy, again, childhood, it's not as active, not as happy, and not as fun. Uh, so we can discuss these results, you know, uh, collectively. And uh, we can see that from the tasting, the three associations, people found that, you know, the, the three big categories is that it's refreshing, that there are certain unexpected events happening, and that it does have some positive emotions and associations. Um, it is consistent with the comparison test about the presets that we just uh, looked at, meaning that you can see that the big category of refreshing aromatic in summer is can correspond to the refreshing category, and uh, it remains true. And then, as well, in both tests, we can see that there was increased disappointment, but also increased calm. Um, but also decrease attractiveness and happiness, which we can kind of contribute also to the unexpected. You know, when you don't get get what you expected, you you are not happy. Um, and also, when we can uh, consider this, look at it from the perspective of the uh, the online test about the quality of beverages, because they also 
ex expressed that the most important thing for a drink is for it to be refreshing and uh and uh, i guess this these particular drinks have succeeded in that because because they both look refreshing um and they also apparently taste refreshing um so advantages of our um study research is that there are many different measures of the associated and effective factors which helps us then compare them and to see whether they're consistent with each other a drawback that i would consider is that um, which actually could probably be a new hypothesis or it could be you know potential new research or something but in order for us to conclude that it is truly disappointment truly you know negative emotions because of the expectation and as we know expectation and disappointment are two sides of the same coin um that uh it would be interesting to see that when they do have to taste that drink how would how would those results be different if they couldn't see the visual cues of course let's say that they're blindfolded uh, or let's say that they are you know in the um sensory less tank or something that still accompanies an effective state um, that's something that obviously just needs to be accepted. There's no way that we can have any study without effective states. But um, but yeah, we could just then compare how much of a role that appearance had in the disappointment. Because the drinks were fine, but I'm not, I don't know how somebody would react even if they don't see that it's pink and pretty and sweet. Um, yeah, so I think that would be that would be valuable to compare, and of course the applications are food technologies and marketing. Um, for instance, if anybody, if any of you have an entrepreneur idea for a new beverage, you can easily look at this list and see that people want it to be refreshing. Twenty, well, not everybody, twenty percent, but still. Um, so, yeah, and marketing. I think uh, your just will obviously have also a lot to say about that in terms of color, of course. Um, and uh, but yeah, the association, the the bottles, all that can play a big role in marketing. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the team who did a lot of work uh, to, to bring Thanks this. A lot. We have some time <laughs> for um, for a brief question or comment. We are a bit running out of time. By the way, uh, your uh, camera uh, seemed to, to be turned off at some point. I mean, I didn't know what, what was that uh, issue there. So, any questions or any comments? <laughs> uh, oh, so probably we will, uh, we could have some more discussion after the second, I mean, after the second presentation on uh on uh, food perception then uh, because this kind of um interrelates to what agni already said well anyway thanks a lot it was really awesome and lots of interesting uh, ideas um uh, from from uh, cross model perception point of view um so if there are no other uh, questions or no other comments are there any comments no no questions, no comments. Then, okay. Well, let me let me go ahead with uh, with um, my part of the this, today's talk. I um, have this weird feeling of giving uh, giving uh, the floor to myself, which is which is weird. And uh, okay, I would uh, I would basically uh, uh, continue with what uh, Agni uh, um, started. Um, uh, and I will, I will focus on the impacts of, of color instead of all the variety of uh, knowledge effects that uh, uh, Agni um, uh, gave a glimpse into. And this is a giant work, of course. Uh, thanks uh, to uh, Liga, thanks to Agni, Anna, Laud, and Janis. This is a giant work, and, and we did it um, as a team. And I would like to give a, a, a brief overview what we know about the impact of um, color on the perception of flavor. That's a, a very brief 
um, sketchy overview. What I will do in the next couple of minutes, then uh, I will give a glimpse into our experimental results. Actually, uh, we have lots of different uh, issues that uh, simply uh, because of time reasons are, are not uh, um, cannot be covered with, within our single in two uh, uh, short um, uh, presentations. Uh, and then uh, uh, some sketch sort of um, draft of uh, cross model architecture of, um, of um, uh, human perception. Okay, so uh, the, the whole story about cross model perception of flavor is, of course, uh, well established, and um, uh, there are things that are not uh, controversial. One not, not controversial thing is um, that the uh, color in general impacts uh, the perception of flavor, and uh, we don't have any contradictory evidence to, to now. So there is another um, uh, issue uh, whether taste or flavor impacts uh, color, and and then we have mixed evidence. There are very few, uh, um, very few studies supporting that it's indeed the case that uh, flavor shaped the uh, perception of color. Well, there is a nice study by Salaj and colleagues, but okay, well that's more or less all we have. And then we have lots of uh, interesting issues that are not uh, entirely discussed in the 2021 research. Uh, let's say, what are the color emotion links triggered by cross model mapping? So what, what's going on with our emotions when we think of uh, uh, haptics in tasting uh, a drink? Imagine if I'm, uh, if I'm using a, a glass instead of a bottle. I'm uh, certainly uh, inducing some emotions because of flavor, but the, uh, uh, the container certainly uh, constrains the way I uh, perceive those emotions. And another thing is, another issue is of course, well, we have lots of higher cognitive processes. The process that uh, Agni uh, was um, uh, referring to, uh, well, for instance, expectations, prior experience, uh, stereotypes about uh, beverage, uh, about food, and these uh, higher cognitive processes, these uh, knowledge effects suddenly constrain the way we uh, perceive um, uh, uh, flavor. And of course, uh, there, there is a lot of work still to be done uh, with other modalities. So what happens with temperature? What happens with haptics? What happens with um, irritation? So this is another area where of course, there is some work, but uh, uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, research and perception, there's a lot of interesting uh, uh, issues to be explored in more detail. But well, what we know, of course, is that uh, color impacts uh, uh, flavor and uh, um, uh, mo most notably flavor identity. Of course, uh, flavor edibility, uh, um, uh, also flavor intensity are imp important issues, but well, you can have a kind of mixed evidence about them. Uh, various, you don't have mixed evidence about flavor identity. Now, imagine if you have a, a, a black and juice, and if you if you if you present it uh, to your subjects in red, then uh, they will not be able. I mean, thirty percent will be able to recognize that it's black and juice. Or imagine you have raspberry juice and you have it in orange or green, then again, you have less than half of your subjects uh, able to recognize what is this uh, thing that they're bringing. So uh, this is this is an absolutely uh, a crucial, uh, unambiguous evidence that we have uh, on, on this issue. So, um, okay, so what we, what we don't know, and the, the, the story gets interesting at this point, of course, also, uh, what are these, uh, uh, what is the exact nature of color impacts of flavor? Because, uh, well, one issue is whether the, these, these impacts are bi-directional. I mean, I, I, I mentioned, I mean, we have impact of uh, color on uh, flavor. Well, we don't know what exactly is, is going on in the other way around. Then um, impacts of color on the intensity of flavor. I mean, there are some studies supporting that uh, color can modulate the intensity of flavor. For instance, uh, if you are using uh, pink, you can modulate, you can increase the percent of sweetness. Okay, well, that's that's what we know. Then, of course, if you have uh, green, you can uh, use uh, uh, the beverage uh, color to, to increase sourness. This is also something that, go, that, that uh, uh, works. Uh, but of course, uh, the kind of straightforward link is uh, 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 color and the perception of identity of, of, of flavor. 
and you can you can use um, inappropriate absent or or a variety of different types of colors, and you can see that it indeed impacts the way we uh, recognize this particular flavor. Uh, then another interesting thing uh, in uh, thinking about uh, uh, colors and flavors is, I mean, we know that color is basically a, 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 um, a combination of three uh, components, hues, brightness, and uh, saturation. And uh, we know that uh, hue certainly matters and also uh, saturation matters. So, but what happens with brightness? It's a, there's a very few, there are very few and, uh, studies on this. And um, we know that, for instance, uh, saturation increases the percentage of freshness or tasteness of flavor. This is a, a very nice study recently, a couple of months ago, uh, actually, a couple of weeks ago, published, uh, where you can see that the freshness kind of uh, uh, modulates, supports uh, 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 the, the uh, overall uh, tasteness, but this is in turn uh, 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 supported by color saturation. It's a very nice uh, study by Combs Kazem of the lot. And then of course, uh, sweetness. Of course, uh, of course, sweetness, uh, although it's culturally variable, I mean, different cultures perceive su uh, sweetness to a different degree. Uh, and um, uh, of course, uh, there is this uh, very uh, close link to liking, to, uh, to affects, uh, to, to pre preferences, emotions. And once we, once we think of emotions uh, as a kind of very closely related to the perception of sweetness, we can of course see that emotions can be used uh, as predictors for, for food choice. And this is, this is a, a, a important uh, study in, in food perception uh, and uh, okay, so I'm let, uh, so let me uh, give you uh, um, uh, let me let me provide you some uh, overview of what we have uh, done. And uh, okay, so um, Agni already told um, about the uh, about these uh, three experiments and uh, the design. So I'm just skipping those. But what what are the results if if thinking about um, uh, colors and likability and preferences. So we have a very clear picture. We have uh, yellow, red, green as the most uh, likable, prefer preferable uh, colors, also pink, white, purple. Uh, and uh, well, this is sort of a relatively uh, nice set of results because it also fits into what other colleagues have done in this field. So negative ratings are for blue, brown, uh, brown and, and gray. Uh, then uh, perceived sweetness. Okay, that's another uh, uh, important issue that I've mentioned before. Uh, well, the uh, the sweet colors. The sweet colors are red, pink, orange, purple, and uh, the last sweet are uh, blue, brown, and 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 gray. And uh, the interesting thing is, of course, uh, if you uh, if you ask colors related to different other objects, not just uh, uh, beverages and other food, you have entirely different picture. I mean, this is just uh, to, to, keep, to keep in mind that this is a, 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 a only in, in, in terms of uh, uh, non-alcoholic beverages. And then of course we have also links between uh, sweetness and, uh, and tastefulness. So this is a, the, the point that I wanted to uh, uh, emphasize and mention before. So uh, sweet, uh, uh, sweet drinks by default seem to be uh, the tasteful ones. I mean, I'm not, Discussing what is the reason about the, of, of this, but okay, this this is something very strong effect. So we have also the perception of uh, sourness, saltiness, and tasteless. So we see that um, we have tested, uh, 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 and we, we see that uh, uh, sourness in terms of sourness, yellow, green, white, or the most prominent uh, colors, salty colors are gray, blue, white, bitter colors, white, gray, brown. And well, then the, the bad thing starts, uh, the bad story starts. Uh, well, you have tasteless colors and they are all negatively uh, uh, valenced. I mean, if you think of bitter or salty colors, they're not necessarily uh, negatively valenced. This is an important issue to be kept in mind. Or you think, uh, if, if you think about tasteless colors, then you have uh, those that are negatively uh, uh, valenced. That's gray, brown, blue. Of course, we don't like beverages in that color. But uh, what kind of interesting uh, observation we were able to see uh, in our results, uh, we have something like a sense of freshness or, 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 or um, uh, and, and this uh, sense of freshness uh, um, 
uh, impacts the likability of flavor. This is a very important uh, uh, finding that we are still working on. Uh, and of course, uh, we have lots of uh, colors that are good in, in, in terms of uh, freshness, so yellow, orange, red, white, and green. Uh, but uh, the, the, the fact that you can have the likability by increasing the sense of freshness is really nice. I mean, this is a Latvian overview of uh, the colors and, and uh, how different uh, colors are uh, uh, um, uh, um, emphasizing the sense of uh, freshness. Uh, this is um, um, uh, actually interesting. In some cases, you can, you can ask about what, what's going on. Why is, is this that prominent and, and why in other cases is is less visible. Uh, then we also check it, what are the differences between different form, um, formats. We, we tested, as, we, as, as you know, we tested the uh, bottles, glasses, and, and also physical co-presence experiments. And the, uh, in, in terms of bottles and glasses, of course, uh, we didn't have a lot of uh, differences, but there are, as you see, differences between uh, red in, in both types of uh, containers. This is interesting. The other interesting observation uh, as, uh, that uh, um, uh, also uh, that uh, Agni mentioned in her presentation is uh, the uh, perception of interesting. Uh, uh, what, what is interesting? What is considered to be interesting? I mean, if you consider, if you compare both types of containers, you have uh, significant uh, differences in that perspective. Um, in tasting experiment, we were kind of puzzled about uh, why we have a very low uh, um, um, perception of sweetness. And there is a one a trivial reason, of course, why, it, why, why, why the, the perception of sweetness was low, because in the, uh, the beverage was uh, no uh, additional sugar. So it was not uh, artificially sweetened. So this is a, a trivial part of the story, but there is another part of the story there's this expectancy effect. I mean, once you think of, once you look at the, uh, at the glass or a bottle and you see the, 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 the color, of course you are expecting certain uh, flavor and certain sweetness and degree of sweetness. And then you have the discrepancy once you taste. And this is interesting. I mean, we'll, we'll uh, work on this also uh, to, to describe uh, this, this effect. This might be, it might be less trivial than it looks and then, of course, as I, as I mentioned before, we have a sense of uh, refreshing, or, or, or which, which is uh, same, which is relatively uh, crucial if, if compared to other, uh, um, to, if, com uh, if compared to other associations or other, other um, um, adjectives. So basically, if compare if if you compared colors in online and, and tasting experiment, then uh, we don't have a lot of differences, except we have the differences in percent of sweetness, and this is really nice because uh, this simply shows that our perception of um, of color has indeed a very strong correlates in the perception of flavor. I mean, there is some takeaway message from this, but okay, this is. Uh, uh, something that doesn't apply to the perception of sweetness uh, by default. So we also tested um, uh, color liking uh, independently on, on, on taste, uh, and that's uh, in, in both uh, cases, in, in black and, and, and flower prints cases, pretty okay, pretty high. Uh, so let me let me go. Uh, let me move to the uh, concluding part of my talk and. Uh, Okay, well, let me know. Colors modulate the sense of sweetness. Colors modulate the sense of flavor, and uh, we can we can of course use it uh, for in the industrial purposes for design uh, of food. Uh, then uh, a sense of refreshment or freshness in general uh, seems to be a very uh, sensitive um, uh, um, seems to be a very sensitive uh, factor, and uh, it has a preferential positive attribute. And uh, of course, here, and I'm, I'm, I'm moving to my final, my final part. Of course, here we can, of course, ask whether it's really that important that we focus on the impact of vision. And indeed, uh, it is um, apparently the case that if you consider how different senses interact, we have a more significant impact. Uh, from the vision than from other sensory modalities. And there are uh, two very prominent uh, uh, studies in the history of perception uh, supporting the view that vision is the uh, uh, main sensory entry area or main sensory 
uh, uh, modules. And that's all, that also ex explains why we cannot uh, always expect uh, the uh, impact of flavor onto color, but we can expect impact from a color to flavor. I mean, this is of course a bit more complex story, but anyway, so we, what we, what we wanted to tell you is, or to show you according to our uh, results is that, uh, okay, in case of flavor perception, we have, uh, we have vision uh, shaping uh, our flavor perception. We have um, uh, hue, saturation, brightness. We have, we have actually other interesting uh, features like durability opacity that is frequently neglected in, in experimental research, but uh, okay. We have auditory perception. We have taste, haptics, olfaction. Um, this all incoming stimuli domains. And we have all, of course, we also have uh, expectations, previous knowledge mentioned by Agni in, in her, Talk and so we, we assume that we have both top down and bottom up uh, uh, interaction once we are perceiving something uh, uh, in terms of flavor and then we have something uh, interesting if we compare cultures and we have also something interesting I mean check uh, different uh, modalities uh, vision auditory olfaction and uh, and flavor perception and, and if you check the bidirectionality if you check other uh, both directions I mean you know, even if you, if you check uh, different colors and color flavor, flavor color per, uh, per perception. It, it's 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 a, a largely neglected area. So this bidirectionality issue is is very fascinating. Also, the strength of emotional links is also a bit uh, underexplored. But anyway, what is Im interesting, and this is my my final uh, point. Uh, there's a lot of um, uh, work about uh, how to improve the likability of uh, drink. But there is a lot, there is very few uh, studies, uh, there are very few studies uh, about uh, the role of uh, freshness, the sense of refreshment. And uh, the point is simply that you have both sensory input and you have also previous knowledge. And this is kind of complex issue. And you have also brand information, which is another thing that we are uh, focusing on in our study and also container type, which is also again, part of incoming the stimuli, but also part of our previous knowledge. We have some expectations when we have, uh, when we see drink in a bottle or drink in a, in a, in a glass. Anyway, so this was my brief uh, and uh, sketchy glimpse into our research. I'd be more happy to have uh, um, uh, any uh, questions or comments or anything to, uh, to be uh, uh, clarified. So any, any questions, any comments, anything to, I mean, we are slightly, uh, we, we are slightly um, uh, exceeding time, but this is, it's uh, in, in general, uh, we are still uh, in uh, good in, in, in time taking into account uh, all uh, today's uh, presentations. Any questions, any comments? No. Okay, if there are no questions or comments, let me move to the next uh, talk in today's um, uh, session. And um, uh, 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 this is uh, uh, a presentation by Marit Wilson. We will tell about uh, Latvian uh, um, uh, uh, athletes and uh, their uh, uh, color perception. And the talk will be in Latvian, so I will switch to Latvian. So, Prex, let's say, Marit Mus, Cognitive was not in Sesia, and that Marit starts with the Latvian sport is class, is where Labdarba sport are not in Yama, and Marit Pasta, the biologist faculty of the Latvian Sound School Committee. That is Sound School Common. Well, Labdien, by my presentation, Redzama. You specifically Redzam, yeah. Yeah. Tātad es vēlos jūs iepazīstināt ar nelielu pētījumu par Latvijas sportistu krāsu izvēli attiecībā uz ikdienas apģērbu, sporta apģērbu un arī ar sportā saistīto emociju asociēšanu ar kādu no krāsām. Kā jau iepriekšējā runātāja stāstīja, tātad krāsu izvēles jautājumi ir veikt ļoti dažādās jomās un sākot no tātad mīļākās krāsas un dažādām citām lietām apģērbam, aksesāriem, interjēram, ēdieniem un auto. 
un, 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 un šoreiz tāds visrunāšu par apģērbu, jo ar apģērbu mēs informējam citus arī par savu personīgo kolektīvo piedarību un arī sportistus un sporta komandas. Mēs identificējam pēc to izvēlētajām vai nu komandas vai valsts nacionālajām krāsām. Krāsu izvēle ietekmē dažādi faktori, tā skaitā dzimums, vecums, izlītības, līmenis, kultūra un vide. Krāsu izvēles pētījumos izmanto divas pieejas, tad vizuālo pieeju, korespondentiem tiekšā ir krāsu palete, un arī verbālo pieeju, kur ir krāsu nosaukumi, un katrs indivīds var iedomāties sev tīkamāko krāsas toni, piesātinājumu un gaišumu. Šeit ir nepieciešamība, protams, cilvēka krāsu pieredze, taču šī pieeja samazina atbilžu izkliedi. Un saskaņā ar ekoloģisko valences teoriju krāsu izvēle izriet no cilvēka dzīves laikā gūtās pieredzes ar krāsām. Ja ir bijuši pozitīvi pieredzējumi ar krāsainu objektu, tas rada lielāku šīs krāsas patikšanu, savukārt negatīvi emocionāli piedzīvojumi ar kādu krāsu, rada mazāku šīs krāsas patikšanu. Šis pētījums tika balstīts uz Deltas tehnoloģiju universitātes veiktu pētījumu, Šeit ir anketa, kas tika nedaudz pārveidota, un daļa jautājumi tika aizstāt ar jautājumiem par sportu, sporta apģērbu, un kā jau minēju arī ar emocijām, kas aizstās ar sportu. Tāpat arī anketā tumši sarkanās krāsas izvēle tika aizstāt ar Latvijas karoga sarkano krāsu, krāsas nosaukumu. Pētījumā kopumā piedalījās 75 Latvijas olimpiskās vienības sportisti, tas ir tā kā valsts atbalstītie paši augstākā līmeņa sasniegumu sportisti, tāds ir pārstāvēja 22 sporta veidus vecumā no 15 līdz 37 gadiem, kopumā tāds ir 45 vīrieši un 30 sievietes. Šajā skaitā bija arī astoņi olimpisko spēļu medaļnieki. Izvēle melnākā, mīļākā krāsa dominēja grupas izvēlē arī pie ikdienas un sporta apģērba 41,3% respondenti. Savukārt mīļākā krāsa arī ikdienas krāsā Ikdienas apģērbā sakrita 25% dalībnieku, kas apstiprināja jau minēto Nīderlandes pētījumā publicēto savukārt mīļākās krāsas izvēle sporta apģērbā bija līdzīga 27% respondentu. Krāsas izvēle sporta starta formā gandrīz puse Sportisti izvēlējās Latvijas sarkano krāsu, šeit netika novērotas kādas atšķirības izvēlēs starp dzimumiem un vecumiem, taču iezīmējās atšķirības starp sporta veidiem, kā piemēram sporta spēļu atlēti iekšroku deva baltējai krāsai starta formā, savukārt cīņas sporta veidī, kas gan nebija pārsteigums izvēlējās tikai divas krāsas, viņiem arī pēc sporta veida noteikumiem, Starta formas drīkst būt tikai divās krāsās, vai nu balta un sarkana, vai balta un zila. Pārsteidza, ka arī kamaniņu sporta pārstāvi izvēlējās tikai divas krāsas. Piedevām gan arī vairāk par 90% Latvijas sarkano krāsu un neliels procents melno krāsu. Krāsa, ar kuru asociējas uzvara, gan arī trešdaļai sportistu grupā un arī pat zimumiem, Tātad tika asociēta Latvijas karoga sarkano krāsu, kam sekoja sarkanā un dzeltenās krāsas izvēle. Interesanti, ka tāda neliela atšķirība, ka sportisti vecumā virs 34 gadiem uzvaru vairāk asociēja ar sarkano krāsu, 
kurai arī pētījumos ir novērots, ka piemīt uzvaras efekti, ka sportisti, kas startē šādas krāsas tērpā, ir vairāk motivētāki, agresīvāki, un viņiem ir lielāk tas izraķis uzvarēt, kas gan ir pierādījies cīņas sporta veidos, bet ne sporta spēlēs. Šajā jautājumā par krāsu uzvarai tika arī bija vismazāka atbilža izkliede, tika minētas deviņas izvēles. Krāsa, ar kuru asociēja zaudējumu, ir melnā krāsa, kam seko nenoteiktas izvēles krāsa un pelēka un brūna. Interesanti, ka vīrieši zaudējumam piešķīra arī rozā un gaiša zaļo krāsu, kuru sievietes savā izvēlē nebija minējušas. Un interesanti, ka arī vecumā līdz 24 gadiem, 27 procentiem respondentu dominēja tieši melnās krāsas izvēle, kas vecumā līdz 34 gadiem samazinājās uz 20 procentiem, bet vecumā pēc 34 gadiem melnā krāsa kā zaudējuma krāsa netika minēta. Šeit zaudējumam tika izvēlēta baltā krāsa. Krāsa, ko asocē ar traumu, gandrīz 23% dalībnieku nebija noteiktas izvēles kādai krāsai. Tomēr melnākā nākošā krāsas izvēle dominē visā grupā. Te ir nelielas atšķirības pārējās. Dzimumiem vīrieši traumu vairāk asocē ar melno krāsu, savukārt sievietēm tā bija kā grupas izvēle nenoteikta krāsa, kam sekojā sarkanās krāsas izvēle. Tālāk krāsa, kas nomierina visā grupā dominēja baltās krāsas izvēle, kam sekoja gaiši zilā un dzeltinā krāsa. Baltās un gaiši zilās krāsas izvēle sakrita arī ar Nīderlandes pētījuma rezultātiem. Šeit šajā nelielā pētījumā es pamanīju nelielas atšķirības starp šīm trīs top krāsām vecuma grupās. Vecumā līdz 24 gadiem sportistiem dominēja zilā krāsa vecumā līdz 34 gadiem baltā krāsa, savukārt vecākiem pār 34 gadiem zeltenā krāsa. Un 12% dalībnieku krāsa, kas nomierina, bija arī mīļākā krāsa. Krāsa, kas uzlādē un dot enerģiju grupā, tā ir sarkanā krāsa, kam seko Latvijas sarkanā un zeltenā krāsa. Šī izvēle ir ļoti līdzīga izvēlē, ko sportisti piešķīra uzvaras krāsai. Tika novērotas atšķirības zimumu atbildēs sīvietēm dominēja tomēr vairāk dzeltenās krāsas izvēle. Krāsa, kas raisa radošumu, šeit dominēja atbildi, ka nav noteiktas krāsas. Tomēr tālāk sekoja gan baltā, gan violetā krāsa. Taču skatot pēc dzimumiem, sievietēm atkal dominēja zeltenās krāsas izvēle. Krāsu izvēle radošumam deva arī vislielāko atbilžu izkliedi, un šeit tika izvēlētas 15 krāsas. Un 9% dalībnieku šī krāsa bija arī mīļākā krāsa. Kas man īstumā būtu visa? Jā, ir kādi jautājumi? Lūdzu. Paldies, Marit. Jā, laiks jautājumiem, komentāriem. Šodien tāda, kā tu saka, nomācoši klusi tā šodienas prezentācija. Nevis prezentācija, bet šodienas sesija nav tādi aktīvi jautātāji, kolēģi būtu. Tas nekas. Tas nekas. Varbūt ir kāds vēl komentārs vai jautājums vai... Es varu kaut ko pajautāt. Es varbūt vienkārši nepamanīju, vai palaidi garām, bet 
bija kaut kāda kontroles grupa, arī kas nav sportā? Nē, 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 nē. Šis bija neliels kursa darbs, un, un te man bija tikai viena izlases kopa, man pieejamie atlēti. Jā, nu, tad, tad varētu apskatīties varbūt kādreiz, bet ir kaut kāda tā dradzina atšķirība, tajā, ko arī tiešām sportistos atlētos, un tad neatlētos. Nu jā, iespējams, jā, jā. Jā. Līdžjutējos un sportistos varētu tā teikt. Piemēram, piemēram, jā. Jā, paldies. <laughs> Arī teikumu. Tā, es tad pēc dalīt ekrāna. Jā, varbūt nu, man ir viena lieta, ko es, protams, zinot, zinot jūs darbu, protams, mazliet nojaušu, bet, piemēram, nu, kā jums šķiet, vai ir iespējams kaut kādā veidā arī nu, praktiski, teiksim, veicināt sportistu veikt spēju, veiksmi, psiholoģisko labsajūtu, izmantojot krāsu. Reksim, viena lieta tā, ka nu, mēs veicam kaut kādu krāsu, aptauju anketu, krāsu testu vai eksperimentu. Tas ir viens stāds, bet teiksim, tā ir praktiski, kā viņš šķiet vai ir iespējams kaut kā uzlabot to nu, reālo sportistu dzīvi kaut kā pielāgojot krāsas. Paldies par jautājumu. Es no rīta pusē uzstājos bioloģijas fakultātes šādā pat konferencē, un te man kā reiz uzdeva jautājumu par izmantotajiem teipiem tādas krāsaini tie, tie tādi kā leikoplastiku izmanto sportā, vai arī tā kā sportistiem ir kaut kāda īpaša vēlme uz kādu krāsu, jo tā kā pēc definīcijas tiem teipiem, nu viņi tā kā ir vienādi, bet tomēr tās krāsas iezīmē to vājumu, stiprumu, teipa un elasticību, elasticitāti. Un tad es nezinu, cik tas ir zinātniski pamatots, bet piemēram mums ir fizioterapeits, kas arī praktizē kineziologiju, un tad arī tā kā uz to augumu, kā ķermenis atbild, tā kā pielieto to teipu sportistam, uz kuru ķermenis atbild un nelīmē to, kas varbūt liekas fizioterapeitam. Tā kā, nu, tur ir tāda interesanta metode, tāpat tur arī atsevišķus medikamentus, kurus tā kā organismus labāk uzņems, tā kā organismus pats dod atbildi, un tad tuvina to teipu tai savainotajai vai vietai, kas ir vāja, Un, 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 un tā. tā kā, un vēl bija interesants novērojums, kad statlasīju foto, beigu foto priekš prezentācijas, tad piemēram mūsu olimpiskais čempions Māris Strambergs Pekinas un Londonas spēlēs. Viņa starta forma tiešām bija sarkana ar baltu. Bet Rio, kur viņš neizcīni jaukstu vietu, viņam bija baltas krāsas forma. Mm. Nu, tas, tā, tad saistība ir pierādīta vai nepierādīta, bet tomēr pastāv. Es, man vēl viens arī vēl tāds papildus komentārs par šo. Mēs iepriekš runājām par garšu un krāsu uztveri. Un, un, un viena lieta, kas ir ļoti maz pētīta, bet nu, kopumā varbūt kādam klātusošiem, varbūt, varbūt jums, Marit, kādreiz ir interesi papētīt, kā krāsu uztveri un vestibulārā uztveri mēdi, bet es atklātu, ka šaubos, vai ir kaut kādi eksperimentāli pamatojumu saistību starp to nu, teipu, un tā, nu, to, to lentu krāsām, un, un, un teiksim, uz, es šaubos. Bet ir viena cita lieta, ka skaits, ka mūsu vestibulārā sistēma ir arī nu, krosmodāli sensitīvi. Tas jautājums tagad ir tāds, nu, kā, kāds ir krāsām. Tā būtu ļoti interesants, tāds, nu, interesants pēdējums virziens, kas ir salīdzinoši maz skaidrs arī tādā uzdienu kognitīvu uzdienu un uztvers pētniecības laukā. Mm-hmm. Jā. Jā. Nu, labi, liels. Paldies. Priešām bija ļoti jauki un interesanti. Un um, ar to mēs tad droši vien, ja nav citu jautājumu, izskatās, ka nav. <laughs> mēs varētu uh, ķerties klāt nākošam šodienas uh, referātam. Un tā ir uh, Laima Kalniņa no Datorikas fakultātes kura prezentē savu pētījumu par fona informācijas izvēli fotogrāfijām. Jā, labdien visiem! Tā, tā, tā. 
Jā. Jā, tā tad es pastāstīšu par Tona informācijas izvēle fotogrāfijā. Un šeit neliels piemērs no dzīves. Viena modeli, viens brīdis, divi dažādi fotogrāfi, dažāda tehnika un dažādi uzstādījumi izvēlēs. Un rezultātā iznāk divas ļoti krasa atšķirīgas bildes. Un tas, kas man liekas interesanti, ir pasīties, kādas, kā izvēlētos šos uzstādījumus cilvēki, kas nav nodarbojušies ar fotogrāfiju un kā atbildēt fotogrāfiju, jo ir diezgan daudz pieņemtas lietas, ko fotogrāfija dara tieši tā, kā līdzīgi kā nozarē jau citu to dara, teiksim tā. Jā, tā tad pētījumā es gribēju apstīties tā tad divas lietas. Galvenokārt, vai respondenti biežāk izvēlēsies attēlus ar mazāk vai lielāku diefragmu satvērumu, un vai viņi izvēlēsies attēlus ar mazāk vai lielāku objektīvu fokusu attēlumu. Un pētījumā tika nodalītas divas grupas – cilvēki, kas ir fotogrāfi un cilvēki, kas nav fotogrāfi. Tātad, lai lai tātad risināt šo jautājumu, tika veikt aptauju. Aptauju tika sadzalīta divās daļās. Vienā daļā respondentiem bija jāizvēlā kāds datāls, kurš viņiem patīk vislabāk. Kopā bija desmit jautājumi, kuriem bija mainīts tātad pieci jautājumi ar mainīt divi pragmas atvērumu un pieci jautājumi ar mainīt fokālo atvēlumu. Un otrajā daļā tika atlasīti fotogrāfu grupa, lai noskaidrotu, ko viņi fotogrāfē, kādus uzstādījumus viņi izvēlās tieši diefragmas atvērumu un kādu objektīvu viņi izbiežāk lieto. Kopā tika aptāvēti 100 cilvēki, 50 fotogrāfi un 50 cilvēki, kas nav fotogrāfi. Un tad sāksim ar diafragmas atvērumu. Tā ļoti vienkārši izsakoties diafragmas atvēruma mērā ar apskaitu, un jau mazāk viņš ir, jo izpūdzušāks ir fonds. Un respektīvi jau lielāks apskaitas ir, jo skaitāk redzam objektu fonā. Un te man būs piemēri ar visām bildēm, kas tika izmantotas aptaujā. Viņš šeit ir sakārtotas tieši šādā secībā no maza apskaita uz lielu. Aptājā viņas tika sajauktas vietām un sajaukt arī gan pokālā attālumu, gan šeit diefragmas atvēruma bildes. Es centos arī iekļaut tādas bildes, kur varētu dalīties viedokļi vairāk vai mazāk, jo pieņemšam šajā bildē Ja ieskatās bildē, kurā ir maz apskaitas pa kreis, jau šie tuvākie domino kauliņi sāk izpūst, un fonds ir pilnībā pazudzis. Un šeit arī var redzēt, ka, teiksim, fotogrāfi nespēja izvēlēties tāp šo vidējo bildi un šo izpūdušāko. Savukārt, cilvēks nav fotogrāfi, diezgan ir vairāk pārliecināts par vidējo variantu, kurā Jā, šis izpūdums ir daudz mazāks. Tad šo lielākā daļā ar bilžu ir novērojums apmēram šāda tendence, jo izpūdušāks jo labāk, jo mazāk var redzēt no fona, jo biežāk cilvēki izvēlās šīs bildes. Tā arī diezgan līdzīgi. Arī, ko var novērot, kad fotogrāfi daudz izteiktāk izvēlās tieši šīs bildes ir izpuldušāk fonu, kā cilvēki, kas nav fotogrāfi. Lai gan arī ir redzams, ka cilvēki, kas nav fotogrāfi, arī joprojām izvēlās visvairāk tieši tās bildes, kur ir izpuldušāk fonu. Jā, šajai bildei arī var cekot, kreisējai bildei ir jau redzams, ka Stīgi ģitārai jau sāk izpūst no tā, cik mazs apskaitas tika izmantots. 
savukārt bildē, kas ir jau visvairāk pa labi, jau viņas vairāk ir fokusā, taču šīs gaismiņas jau vairs nerada to pašu efektu. Un jā, šeit mēs redzam arī fotogrāfu grupa ir nedaudz sadalījusies šajā izvēlē. Tā, un tad bildē modeli abām grupām diezgan skaidri izvēle ir izvēlēties izpuldušu fonu. Jā, un tad apskatot vidējos, ļoti labi var redzēt tiešām šo atšķirību, ka cilvēks ir fotogrāfs daudz izteiktāk izvēlās tieši bildes ar mazāko ekskaitu. Un jā. Tālāk par fokālo attālumu. Fokālais attālums nosaka, cik daudz tiks ietvert bildē no fona principā. Un tik izvēlēt trīs fokāli attālumi, 35 mm, kas ir jau vairāk uz plotlinki pusi, 50 mm, kas vismaz fotogrāfa aprindās tiek uzsvērts kā tāds standarts, kā var teikt, un 85 mm objektīvs, kas jau vairāk tiek izmantots tieši portretiem un līdzīgām jomām. Un jā, šī ir tā trīs biežākie objektīvi, kas ir ar fiksētu fokālu atāmu, ko cilvēki izvēlas. Un ļoti bieži ir fotogrāfu vidū tādas neizpratni, kur izvēlēties, jo nevienmēr viss nopirks visus, un tāpēc ļoti liels debats notiek par to, kurš tad būtu tas, kur tiešām vajadzētu. Un tā tad šeit jau var redzēt tā tad pakreisi bildi ar mazāku fokālu attālumu, un tā tad tiek ietverts vairāk no telpas šis lenčs, savukārt, kur jau ir liels fokālais attālums, jau tiek ietverts mazāk no fono, bet joprojām visi objekti ir ietverti. Arī jāņem mērā, jo platāks lenčs jo mazāk fokālais attālums, jo vairāk parādīsies visādi defekti bildē, kā izliekt lenķi un izliekt galdi un visu kaut kas tā. Jā, tālāk šeit ļoti labi var redzēt šo uztverto ideju, ka 85 mm objektīvi ir paredzēti vislabāk portretiem, Redzam, ka cilvēki visvairāk izvēlējās tieši šo bildi, kura bija uzņemta ar lielāku fokālu attālumu. Tā vietā, kā izvēlēties bildi, kur ir vairāk platleņķi, kur jau tiek ietvers vairāk fonas. Līdzīgi arī šeit ir cilvēki izvēlējušies vairāk kā tieši bildi ar lielu fokālu attālumu. Un arī šeit arī interesanti, kad cilvēks nav fotogrāfi, šeit ir izvēlējušies, nav bijis, nav tik skaidri redzams, ko tieši, kura bildi tieši viņiem liekas vislabākā. Un jāsaka, ka bildes diezgan līdzīgas, taču atšķirības viņās pavisam noteikti ir. Un jā, šeit arī skaidri uzvarējas bildi ar lielu fokālu attālu. Un apkopojot, jā, tātad vidējos šīm bildēm arī redzams, ka fotogrāfa grupa ir daudz izteiktāk izvēlējusies tiešām bildes ar lielu fokālu attālu kā cilvēki, kas nav fotogrāfi. Un, man likās, to redzu ir ļoti interesanti, katrs cilvēka videjo rādījumu abošajiem mainīgajiem ievat grafikā. Un šeit var ļoti labi redzēt, ka visi šie rezultāti ir iekļaut principā vienā vietā. Un mēs redzam, 
ir, ir tāda daža rezultāta, kas varbūt neiekļaujās tik labi, bet uh, tomēr uh, ir šī tendence uz, uh, uz lielu uh, fokālu attālumu un uz mazu efskaitu. Un uh, man liekā tur interesanti apstīties, uh, kā, uh, kādas atšķirības tāds ir uh, starp grupām. Un uh, šis, manuprāt, ir vis, uh, visinteresantākais uh, no, no visiem rezultātiem. Mēs redzam, ka tā fotogrāfa tiešām ir vienā no šajiem kvadrantiem uh, bāzēt vienā vietā. Uh, tā vietā cilvēki, kas nav fotogrāfi, ir vairāk izplūduši un uh, uh, ir ļoti daudz dažādi, dažādi atbildes pareizās viņiem. Un te varbūt arī... Um, tāds pārdoms par to visu, ka cilvēki, kas piedāvā šos fotogrāfu pakalpojumus, nevienmēr neskrīt ar cilvēkiem, kas, kas meklē šos, šo fotogrāfu un iespējams cilvēki, kas atrodas tālāk no tā, ko fotogrāfu vidēji piedāvā, nevar atrast īsto fotogrāfu sev, teiksim to tā. Un uh, viens no iemesliem, kāpēc fotogrāfi varētu būt tik ļoti bāzēts šajā vienā, vienā grafiku uh, kvadrantā, ir tas, ka lielākā daļa uh, no aptaujas respondentiem ir uh, individuāls fotosesijas uzņem. Uh, pasākumi kādas arī, ja ģimenes, uh, viss šīs jomas ir, uh, ir diezgan bāzētas uz... Uh, Nav nepieciešams šajās jomās tik skaidras bildes varbūt un redzēt visu fonu. Savukārt, ja mēs skatāmies ainavu un arhitektūru, tā ir salīdzinoši mazāk pārstāvēt un tāpēc arī varbūt neparādās šie rezultāti, kas ir vairāk bāzēti uz, 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 uz visām detaļām. <laughs> un tālāk par jautājumiem, kas tika uzdot tieši fotogrāfiem. Tātad vai ir noteikts diepram katvērums vai apskaits, ko tātad fotogrāfi lai to 33 cilvēki atbildēja, ka ir. Un jā, tika nosaukti šie apskaidi, kas principā ir uztverim tā ļoti mazi, un kas parāda, ka tiešām ir fotogrāfi tiešām cenšās izmantot tieši, tieši Tādas uzstādījumas, lai fons būtu pēc iespējas vairāk izplūdis. Un par objektīvu izvēli jau bija daudz vairāk cilvēku, kuriem bija konkrētas izvēles. Šeit mēs redzam, 50 mm ir vispopulārākais objektīvs, kas arī bija tas, kas iekļauts kā vidējā, vidējā, vidējais attēls aptaujā. Un nākamais 35, kas jau ir tāds jau platāks un arī tik iekļauts aptaujā. Un šeit arī uh, nozīmīgi ir tas, ka parādās diezgan daudz uh, cilvēku, kas izmanto šos objektīvus uz uh, šī mazāk sensoru izmēru, un rezultātā tāpēc viņiem uh, uzņemtās bildes sanāk. Uh, tas, tas, ta, tas, kas ir uh, objektīva, uz objektīvu rakstīts, nav tas, kas sanāk realitātē, jo bildes sanāk daudz vairāk. Uh, daudz tuvāk. Jā, un arī vēl viens būtis faktors, kad uh, ne, ne, ne visi fotogrāfi var, izmanto, var izvēlēties no visiem objektīviem, un uh, 50 mm objektīvs ir viens no tiem, kas ir viens no lētākajiem, un tāpēc ļoti daudzi uh, fotogrāfi, kas ir nekuši iesācēji, bet sāk savu karjeru izvēlēt tieši šo, jo viņu var uh, viegli atļauties un viņš dot labus rezultātus. Tā kā tas ir viens no iemeslēm, kāpēc arī tas rāda būt viens no populārākiem. Un jā, no iegūtajiem rezultātiem diezgan secināt, kad uh, cilvēki izvēles biežā fotogrāfijas ir mazāk apskaiti un ar lielāku fokālu attālumu un kad uh, pastāv atšķirības starp šīm grupām. Uh, paldies par uzmanību! Paldies par lielisko, interesanto un, un patiesībā 
Šustoj spētniecībā pretī fokusā to prezentāciju jautājumu komentāri. Mums ir laiks jautājumiem un komentāriem. Paldies, man jautājums tiešām interesanti. Kā jums šķiet, kā paristēs cilvēks, kurš ne rāda fotogrāfiju, bet vērtē, kā varētu atšķirties tie vērtējumi fotogrāfu un paristo cilvēku vērtējumi par kaut kādām fotogrāfijām, kā viņi izvēlētos, kura ir patīkamāka un labāka? Jā, es domāju, ka iespējams fotogrāfi vairāk pievērs uzmanības niensēm, es teiktu, jo diezgan bieži viņi tiešām tā atgriezniskā saita, ko es dabūju, bija, ka es izvēlējos tos, kur bija visvairāk izpūdas fons un mazāk fona objekti, tā vietā, kā grūti pateikt, ko izvēlējās cilvēki, kas nav tieši fotogrāfs, bet jā, man tas liekas interesanti, jo cilvēki, kas, kuram nav pieredze šajā fotogrāfijā, ļoti bieži neizpēta šo jomu. Un tāpēc, man liekas, interesanti, ko viņi izvēlētos, ja viņi izvēlētos. Bet kā jums, es atvienies vēl vienu tad izsādam, kā jums šķiet, kā fotogrāfi vērtētu tās tendences, ko jūs novērtojat parasto cilvēku fotogrāfijā, vai viņi būtu ļoti kritiski, vai viņi Tā kā arī atrast tur kaut ko tādu patīkam. Nu, tieši aptaujas ietvaros vai vispār? Es varbūt nesaprotu to jautājumu. Es domāju, vispār, vispār nevis aptaujas ietvaros. Jā, ok. Jā, man liekas fotogrāfi kopumā spēj nonākt tādā ļoti kritiskā fāzē, kur viņš skatās tiešām uz tādām kļūdām, bet viens beigās tās bildes, kas tev patīk, man liekas, ir jābūt tām bildēm, kas tev patīk, un nevajag vispār domāt par kritiku. Jā, paldies. Paldies, vēl kādi jautājumi vai kādi komentāri. Man viens jautājums, kas mēs laika domājot par jūsu darbu, Kā jums šķiet, kāpēc citās preferences tomēr cilvēkiem, gan profesionāļiem, gan vienkāršajiem ierindas vērotājiem, kāpēc jums tomēr tādas ir? Vai tur ir kaut kāds uztveris, kaut kāda lieta, vai tomēr tā ir kaut kāda, varētu teikt, stila jautājums, varbūt ir kaut kāda fotografēšana stils, kas cilvēkiem patīk, un no tā izrajot mums rodās tāda preference. Noteikti, es domāju, jā, ka tā varētu būt tāda lieta, ko iemācās ar laiku, jo, nu, labi, varbūt tas nav labs salīdzinājums, bet bērndārzā ļoti daudz bērnu zīmē viss pie labs apakšas, līdz viņiem iemācas tā nedarīt. Un fotogrāfi līdzīgi tev kāds pasaka, tā nedara, tad tu tā vairs nedari tā laiku. Jā, man liekas, tas būtu daudz interesantāk pie katrs izpētīt vairāk, kurā darīt nevis sekotu tam, kas ir šobrīd populārs, varbūt tā. Jo, jā. Jā. Jo, man vienkārši zināt savu prātā, tā vēl interesanta lieta ir, teiksim, piemēram, ar varbūt kādu, nezinu, mākslīgā intelekta sistēmas palīdzību varētu salasīt vecas bildes un, teiksim, skatīties, kas ir tas īpatsvars, kuras ir tās saucamās, nu, visbiežāk reproducētās bildes, vai tās pašas, nu, teiksim, tās, piemēram, dievaprādījums īpatnības un lēmiķi un tā, vai tas mainījies laika gaitā, jo tas jautājums ir iznībā ļoti, nu, tāds būtisks, tas tiešām ir, vai ir kaut kādi mūsu tādi, nu, tādi būtiski uztveres principi, kuri nosaka, kurām bildēm mēs dodam priekšroku, vai arī tomēr tas ir tas kaut kāds asociatīvās mācīšanās kaut kāds princips, vai arī būtu visicamāk abējādi. Ok, vai ir vēl kāds varbūt kāds komentārs vai kāds jautājums vai kāds... Ja nav, tad, teiksim, lielu paldies laimē, brīdi tiešām ļoti interesanti un labi. Un paldies, un tad mēs esam nonākuši līdz šodienas darba kārtības pēdējai prezentācijai, un es pārslēdzos atkal uz Angļodi, jo pēdējā mūsu šodienas prezentācija atkal būs Angļodā. 
So I'm delighted to switch to English. Uh, our final presentation before the keynote is um, a presentation by, by uh, our lab, by, by League, uh, Sandra Bartoszewicz and Diana Ritter and me uh, on uh, the effects of axial alignment and verbal knowledge on the shape perception, the case of square or diamond. I'm giving the floor to uh, Liga. Oh, no, you cannot hear me. Okay. So, um, so okay. Uh, thanks. Um, this is the last presentation and I uh, will try to be uh, in time so we can have a short break for a keynote. Uh, so I will tell about uh, the study, uh, effects on actual alignment and verbal knowledge on the shape perception, the case of square and diamond. So um, we, um, um, we started this uh, study because um, uh, we got the new equipment last uh, year. Uh, I um, tracking uh, equipment, and then we uh, were thinking about uh, some experiment where we can get uh, familiar with uh, with it, and also that could be interesting and fit into our other uh, subjects that we study in the lab. So this is a rather um, um, simple in terms of design uh, study, and uh, it is about uh, shape perception. So the previous um, studies have shown that uh, shape perception is dependent on a variety of uh, factors, including um, geometrical features like object symmetry and axial, axial information, also to figure ground segregation, uh, as well as the previous knowledge. And uh, the knowledge can be uh, of different type, like uh, verbal or visual, and uh, it, it gets expressed uh, through um, through our expectations and um, um, also desires and uh, many other like um, um, aspects where we where we are um, using our, our knowledge and um, and it also uh, can be induced by um, by the language. So uh, the previous studies have also shown that language uh, impacts perception and also shape perception. So um, it is shown that um, the knowledge um, 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 works both in top-down uh, processes, language, language impact on, uh, on perception. And uh, uh, for example, in recognition, when, uh, when our knowledge uh, helps us uh, as, um, uh, perceive uh, things in a certain way. So, but it works also in another direction when objects, uh, object features um, um, also can impact our, um, our perception. And uh, uh, concerning language, uh, it is uh, found in the studies that it supports uh, also the um, categorical perception. So all this, um, type of perspective um, we took into account uh, uh, when uh, we um, created our uh, research question. And so we used um, stimuli, which are which has been studied uh, since a long while already, uh, about perception of uh, square and uh, rhombus. So um, it has been shown uh, that uh, um, this uh, stimulus can be um, perceived as square, uh, usually when it is in this uh, standard position, like, uh, like in the first figure that you see, but uh, when it is rotated, uh, then it tends to be uh, perceived uh, also as a rhombus. And um, here, of course, we have to consider that uh, there is a role also about, um, role uh, in our knowledge about, uh, about what is square and what is rhombus. But as because if we uh, think mathematically, both of the shapes are um, actually the same. So um, we um, 
we conducted uh, two um, sets of experiments. One, one was an eye tracking experiment and another was online study. And in both of them, uh, we um, tested the impact of verbal instructions and uh, also the impact of object rotation on the shape perception, considering this, uh, this shape square and rhombus at the same time. So uh, for eye tracking experiment, uh, we um, had uh, 30 um, participants for our study, we had uh, 69, um, but um, first I will tell about this eye tracking experiment. So we were showing this, uh, this stimulus uh, for uh, five seconds for the participants. Uh, we had uh, four groups of participants. Um, one um, after uh, calibration uh, just um, um, were in front of uh, one of the stimuli uh, without any other prior instructions, just uh, about the process that there will be, um, that, that the person has to look on the stimulus. Uh, and then uh, the stimulus that was shown was square for another group, it was rhombus. There are also two uh, more groups, uh, uh, which uh, for which uh, uh, the one was uh, also instructed that please observe the square, and the fourth group was instructed please observe the rhombus. And um, so these all are different persons. So we had uh, between group experiment. Our assumption was that. Um, the prior extra instructions uh, modulate the gaze pattern uh, in uh, respect to duration and number of fixations, uh, scan pass and saccades. And um, we assume that uh, in uh, case of uh, one figure, uh, these, uh, these um, aspects would be uh, different uh, if we uh, take as a factor the instruction. So, if the persons, uh, if the participants look to the square, uh, they would, the eye would move uh, different. Uh, um, if they saw a square, and they had also instructions that please look to the square. So and um, yeah, so that was our, our main assumption. So what uh, the results showed us uh, that uh, generally uh, we can observe such tendencies. Uh, with uh, prior instruction, instructions, we uh, could observe more focused uh, gaze pass and distribution of uh, fixations. And uh, we could observe also, also different, um, um, different pattern uh, on uh, these fixation durations, which were uh, longer in, uh, on vertical axis uh, with prior instructions. Uh, but without prior instructions, uh, these, um, um, these indicators of eye movements uh, were uh, less focused and uh, duration uh, were longer on the horizontal axis. So it's generally also is um, the direction uh, in which we, for example, scan things. So, and there were also less uh, psychedic eye movements in this, uh, um, in this uh, cases um, when we didn't use instructions. Uh, the online study was, um, uh, was a, uh, in the online study, we again use the same stimuli, just uh, there were some additional stimuli, uh, that is, we rotated square uh, um, around uh, 15 degrees, and um, the stimuli were uh, presented in randomized order for persons. And we had three uh, groups of, um, of uh, participants. So uh, one, in uh, one group, uh, we gave uh, instructions that um, the person had to answer if the figures that you will see in the further is uh, a rhombus. And then the person uh, was, um, uh, the rhombus was uh, presented to the person and um, he had to um, choose between two options. It is rhombus or it's square. 
And uh, for the second group, there was a question uh, that person had to tell if that is a square which will be presented. And the person were presented with a square and had two options uh, uh, for answering the question, what figure do you see, a square or rhombus? So, and the third group, group was um, just, um, for the third group, there was just shown the figure and um, they, there were no uh, prior instructions. So it was really a short um, test, also taking just five minutes in average to take for the participants. So, um, uh, our assumptions uh, were that also this verbal instruction uh, could um, could impact uh, what selection uh, the participant uh, does, and also that um, rotation of um, uh, rotation degree of the figure would uh, change uh, uh, their selections. So. Okay, what was the result? Um, so the overview of the results are in the, gra uh, in the graph or diagram. So um, we noticed that um, instructions induce larger uh, corresponding categories of rotated shapes. So it means uh, when uh, we um, said persons that, uh, that they uh, have to answer if that has been, um, that they will see um, square, uh, then it was more likely that they um, will answer uh, that it is square in this uh, uh, different, uh, different, con um, different conditions in, 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 some in respect to rotation. So for example, we can see the first, um, first um, bar chart uh, when the persons were uh, uh, in the instruction forms that they will see rhombus we see that uh, in uh, there are a high, uh, larger proportion of persons who have uh, indicated that the seen figures are rhombus what is uh, actually interesting is that uh, it's different uh, in case of uh, when they really were um, observing uh, the object, which we assume is more likely uh, rhombus, this is um, 45 uh, degrees uh, rotation. So we see that actually uh, in the case of instruction of rhombus, uh, less persons have uh, indicated that it is rhombus. So probably they have uh, oversaw to themselves more uh, what, what is rhombus not just like first impression about the figure. In case of uh, square, um, we see that uh, here um, persons, uh, when the instruction of square per, uh, participants have uh, um, more often uh, indicated that the square in all the rotation positions, but uh, when there were no uh, instruction, then this, uh, this category distribution is uh, more gradual. So uh, when the degree is uh, closer to, to this um, 0 0.90, mm, not, uh, 0.90 degrees uh, axis, then um, it's more perceived as a square, but as it uh, gets more rotated, it gets more uh, perceived uh, as, a, um, as a rhombus. So, um, yeah, there were uh, differences uh, when comparing um, each three groups in terms of uh, each of these stimulus, how they, uh, have, what proportions have been, um, have been uh, indicated uh, respective to this position. And uh, also we saw that uh, in between one group, uh, the stimulus were um, differently evaluated. Uh, regarding these categories. Okay, so generally, um, we saw uh, what we were, assume, uh, were, were assuming, assuming that uh, there are um, effects of um, instruction, instruction and also there 
were impact, uh, there were, um, it was possible to observe impact of rotation. And um, yeah, in case of, uh, in both cases, though, they were uh, less, uh, they were uh, subtle than previously we assumed. So I don't know if it was not too short, but generally <laughs> this is, uh, this is shortly about this uh, study, and if there are questions, please let me know. Thanks, we have time for questions, comments, critique, any uh, issues to be discussed? Hi, I do not have a question, I have a comment. It's very interesting that in the cases where um, where the rhombus was not mentioned at all, people were more in, like, they thought that rhombus makes sense. But once you either mention rhombus or something, they suddenly maybe overthink it or something. What, what do you think, what, what's going on in there? Uh, why, why do they, uh, at the instruction of rhombus, consider it considered the opposite uh, choice? Um. Actually, I really think that uh, they um, they were not sure what is rhombus, and they probably check what is rhombus because for us it's really very clear what is rhombus. But um, but generally, also a square is a rhombus if we think oh, yeah. from a mathematical yeah. point of view. So um, so I, I I don't know. Like I think that they really were uh, were. Um, thinking about the definition of, of, of this object. And then also the square would see, uh, also this rhombus would see, seem as a square because square is a specific case of rhombus. So it's more appropriate. But um, we actually- I, Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, I thought, um, I don't think I remember. Um, were the tests timed like um, in a sense that, um, they had a limited amount of time to decide or they had all the time in the world? Um, I mean, they had all the time. Yeah. Well, maybe if we would, if, if, if we would check whether, if they had less time, like how would that affect their decision-making? Maybe that overthinking is what leads to these types of data. Um, could be, could be probably, but uh, we have additionally here some data about uh, uh, where we questions where we check uh, if they know what is the what is rhombus we provided them with the definition so they have to choose okay. and we also provided them with uh, four type of uh, objects which we can which they could select which are the which are the rhombus and they were also on this uh, square type of figure and rhombus which is more likely like rhombus like diamond shape and uh, mm -hmm. yeah. so we find out about their knowledge also in this case. Um, but it was actually also for me a surprise when they know that it's rhombus that they actually uh, more likely say that it's it's square. Yeah. Even when they re, even when the instruction is square, um, they still kind of it's there's still more rhombuses than when they when you instruct rhombuses, which is yeah, 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 just, exactly. Yeah. It is yeah. really strange. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So, thank you. Yeah. I mean, Wait, we have a question from Yegri. Um, yeah, thank you. It's Eugene Prescorins from Riga Strategy University speaking. And I just wanted to ask about like, um, have you, maybe it's a similar question like uh, uh, about, uh, have you considered to include uh, this uh, prior knowledge or like uh, knowledge about uh, this um, rhombus or square uh, to estimate uh, if um, like somehow um, uh, how, how it uh, influences the um, ability to categorize between different shapes? I mean, like, is there any option on how to include this factor of uh, prior knowledge, um, mm -hmm. just uh, for people to be able to distinguish yeah. between those two shapes? How do you think? Thanks. Uh, I think actually Agni had a good good idea about this. Uh, if they would um, have limited time, 
then uh, for example if they had just uh, for example we, we would uh, test uh, the reaction time or or some some like this type of thing could help um, but the impact of knowledge um, we cannot ask questions before we test because then we um, already uh, give them information and this knowledge which they really could use. So here we were assuming that they uh, will just rely on their knowledge without really searching that. Maybe if we had like laboratory experiment where we have persons which cannot, um, cannot really, yeah. Anyway, it depends on their background. Actually, several persons yeah. would know exactly what is uh, what is rhombus, and some persons don't know the definition. Yeah. So I think there should be kind of a bias if they uh, like don't know what what really rhombus is, right? Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> I actually, I can't answer your question. Okay. So maybe you would no help. Thank you. Well, there is a um, uh, there is a uh, point that we um, should keep in mind. We had uh, uh, the eye tracking study, which means that we have kind of um, uh, uh, co comparable data uh, that would um, uh, show something concerning the real uh, real time uh, dynamics. Which means that in those uh, cases, uh, people are not. Uh, I, I mean, I also refer to actually to Agni's uh, question. People are not sort of overthinking or reflecting because that's a, just a millisecond-wise uh, 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 process. So I think um, uh, even uh, though they might have uh, kind of obscure knowledge about what is uh, a rhombus or diamond or square, they still have sort of um, a, 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 well a pattern of, uh, of uh, uh, gaze uh, uh, movements once uh, once we record and, and this. This is actually interesting in, in the data of um, from uh, from our, our track, our tracking uh, experiment. I think it, it fits kind of uh, what what we also were able to observe in, in the um, the selectional task. Yeah. So yeah, what 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 to add here is that uh, actually when we perceive thing, we generally it is the same the same object. It is just a little bit rotated and. Uh, uh, at some point, we have some extra information. Uh, what what could we um, uh, evaluate as a knowledge? So, we anyways we have all of us have some knowledge about squares and rhombuses, um, and that's not linked with if we know the definition or, or if we do not. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, well, yeah. Sorry, maybe just a quick, because it's not really a question, it's more um, a comment. I mean, for me, it's a question, but um, um, how may, many people said um, um, consistently that it's one type of shape, like only square or only rhombus? And was this um, dependent on what they were told before? Um, this is what I wonder, but we can discuss another time also. <laughs> so, um... Okay, yeah, probably there were uh, definitely persons uh, which were uh, probably with some math background, which right away knew that all of them are squares uh, more than, uh, than uh, rhombus. Um, still, uh, even if we assume that, that these are these 38 persons uh, which uh, chose this option, um, which would, I, I'm not sharing now, but there were 38 persons uh, telling that it's square uh, in a case when it was like in rhombus position. So anyway, there is this difference uh, comparing these groups, which uh, still is uh, is uh, rather large. In one case, it's uh, like 10%. In another, it's even 20% difference. Um, so, but it's not relative. It's just like in, in these numbers, which I check now. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks a lot. I think we are running out of time. And uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, and thanks a lot for the questions. And let's make a um, well, 12 minutes break uh, before our um, uh, keynote, uh, our closing keynote. 
And uh, um, well, let me thank uh, you all again to, to all of you who presented today's uh, COGSI session at uh, our International Scientific Conference at the University of Latvia. So thanks a lot. And uh, well, let's grab some coffee or tea and uh, let's uh, continue with uh, Michael Glansberg in just uh, 12 minutes. So, hi, hey, Elias, how are you? How are you doing? Not too bad. It's snowing here as it's been for the last two weeks. Um, <laughs> it seems that's a kind of um, shared condition in the kind of, well, most of the civilization at the moment. <laughs> well, everybody's weather is bad. Uh, well, we are having probably the snowiest uh, winter since I think probably 10 years or more. Uh -huh. uh, very low temperatures. Um, but um, yeah, it's so great to, to see you and to, to so great to, to have you here. So probably we should uh, go ahead because we, we are, uh, uh, we are uh, 5 p.m. Latvian time, and uh, let me let me say some intro, and we could we could basically go ahead. So, well, first of all, uh, on behalf of the Faculty of Computing and behalf of the University of Latvia, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce Michael Glansberg, um, who is the keynote of uh, 79th International University of Latvia Conference Cognitive Science uh, session. And uh, I'm very happy because uh, Michael is not only uh, one of the leading philosophers of logic, mathematics, linguistics, and model theory, but also one of the very few people that I know with a kind of comprehensive overview of what is going on in all these different fields. What is going on in CogSci, what is going on in psychology, what is going on in linguistics, mathematics, and philosophy. And I'm very delighted to have Michael as a, our uh, keynote today. Uh, and um, a couple of words about um, Michael's previous um, work. Um, he has uh, studied philosophy and mathematics at uh, Harvard University. Then uh, he was a professor at MIT, Toronto, UC Davis, Northwestern. At, at the moment, he's a professor at uh, the University of Rutgers. I hope I, I haven't missed anything. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like enough. <laughs> well, uh, well, anyway, so uh, last but not the least, uh, 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 I'm uh, 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 privately delighted uh, to introduce Michael because he's also the chair of the uh, scientific uh, board of our lab. And uh, this is something that uh, our lab members and uh, we all are especially proud and happy about. So, and now I'm not going, not going to waste any time more. So uh, the, the floor is yours, Michael. We are oh, thank you. Let me begin by seeing if I can share my screen, which it looks like I can. Yeah, the one, the one thing I'm disappointed is that I'm not able to be in Riga right now. It would be wonderful to be there. Um, New Jersey in the US has its charms, but we have no Art Deco buildings. We have no medieval buildings, actually zero medieval buildings. That is for certain. <laughs> um, so there's a great deal to be missed. Um, so even though I'm very happy to be here, I'd be even happier if I was there. <laughs> um, let me tell you a little bit about what I wanted to talk about today. So I want to talk about, I, I noticed that when I did the title, I forgot something rather important. I said cognitive models and semantic models. I should have said of language, which is what I mostly work on. And I just sort of forgot. So what I want to talk about are a couple of different projects in ways that many of us approach modeling language and how to try and bring them together. Um, the goal of the talk is to do a fairly broad overview. I will cover some work that I and collaborators have done. I will cover some work in particular that um, 
I'm, we're in the middle of doing with Jurgis and other people in his lab, and I'm going to mention a few teasers of results that we're getting excited about there. Um, but mostly I wanna talk about how to bring some projects together. Some of these are projects that some of you will know, but they come from rather different corners of the world of cognitive sciences. And so a lot of what we'll be trying to do is see how to make them fit. So the first thing is, so how do we model language? Oops, I need to get my screen responding. Yes, and the first thing I need to do is to disappoint you a little bit, particularly if you're coming, I, I know many of you are in the faculty of computer science, and there's a paradigm for studying language in computer science, which I'm going to mention only to say that that's not what I'm going to talk about. Um, it's incredibly interesting, but not the direction that we want to go. So there's a very well-known computational paradigm whose success is undeniable because you can pull out your smartphone and you can speak to it in ways that are though, I suppose less than the engineers would hope over the long term, rather good, especially compared to where it was 10 years ago. And you might be aware of the kinds of tools that are used to build these sorts of devices, these, these agents. Um, these days, the paradigm is very much deep learning. Um, and, you know, it has these features that you do um, vector-based analyses on heavily trained, rather complex neural network architectures that do amazing things. Um, so many things, right? So the, the effectiveness of sentiment analysis, um, there's a lab in Texas that can predict the, a student's GPA grade point average, the student's success in the first year of college based on a rather subtle analysis of the essay they submit as part of their application. Um, it's highly reliable, even though we don't totally understand it. Um, and you might also know, again, just to set aside, there are now some extreme heavyweights readily available in the computational world. Here's BERT. If you do a little bit of natural language processing, you'll probably know about BERT. BERT is big and powerful and ridiculously successful. Um, and interestingly, I was looking at BERT's like stats here. BERT uses a rather small corpus compared to some earlier devices. Um, Bert's run off about 3.3 billion words, but trained over 40 cycles. Older devices were usually run off of training corpuses in the neighborhood of several trillion words or unique tokens. So anyway, the, the, the devices here, the, the computational power is, is impressive and the success is good. And so you might be asking, why don't we just talk about that? And well, part of the answer is because I don't know much about it. Um, but there's more of an answer. Um, there's several ways in which for all their success, a lot of the NLP models we see these days are not tailored to certain kinds of sub psychological and linguistic questions. And not by accident, they're not trying to be. So this is not criticism. But one thing is just that the architecture, the neural network architecture is very far away from anything we know about the neurophysiology of language, partly because we know incredibly little about the neurophysiology of language. Unlike say the case of, of low level vision where we can actually make some fairly good comparisons, here we're quite cut off, learning language goes at least as best as we can tell in a rather different trajectory than BERT does. Um, children are incredibly good at acquiring word meanings around the age of two. They can do it more or less in one trial or at least a few trials. Whereas BERT, even though BERT uses impressively little trial time, it's still 40 cycles through billions of tokens. Children don't do that. And children's word le learning is, it's quick and easy in ways that we just don't seem to learn 
from some of these very heavy computational devices and also just the sheer computing power compared to the easy and uniform trajectory in which children and adults acquire their languages remains unhappy. It's not a good match. So that's just to remind us why there are other things we want to do, but then where should we look? Oh, and the other thing, as I will talk, I won't talk very much about, if you're a linguist and you're interested in the extremely precise descriptions of specific languages and their grammars, some of these NLP architectures, though they do approximations extremely well, crash very badly on some details. So we want to know what else we can do. And there's quite a bit, and that's what I do want to spend our time on. Two approaches I want to make use of and to a certain degree, both contrast and try and combine and compare. Cognitive psychology, including developmental psychology would seem like a very natural place to look. Um, because in fact, cognitive psychology has already since well, I suppose since time immemorial, but certainly since the 1970s, when much of this sort of began to develop in earnest, has been showing us a lot about things that connect closely to language. So we'll talk about this later, so I'm not gonna dwell on it now, but if you happen to know a little bit of the cog psychology literature, think about a long and well-developed literature on concepts and categories, which helps us to understand things like how it is that a child or an adult represents the notion of dog in their head, which you do. And it corresponds to, if you're an English speaker, um, you're understanding the sound dog and mapping it to that, as we say, concept. There's some well-developed explanations there. Um, and if you wanna know something about what the, a word like dog in English means, you would do worse than to go consult a cognitive psychologist working on concepts. And much more here, um, acquisition. Acquisition studies have been divided quite a bit between people who are, as it were, core linguists who wanna know particulars, like at which point do you um, acquire your tense system if you're speaking which languages. And they've discovered some really interesting differences that speakers of different languages acquire different bits of fine-grained linguistic structure at ever so slightly different times, which when this was first discovered was shocking. We all assumed that the basic structure would be the same for everybody. You'll also find lots of psychologists doing this because psychologists are interested in how children learn anything early. And amongst the things children learn relatively uniformly early is how to use their words. And so you'll see a ton of information about how children learn about the world, much of which is about how they acquire their languages. Neurophysiology hides in the corners these days. As I said, we know extremely little about the neurophysiology of language. And what we know is from data that is extremely difficult to use. Part of the reason is language processing goes very fast and some of the prettiest tools for neuroimaging like fMRIs take a long time compared to how long it takes to process a sentence. So the tools that are used in neurolinguistics are difficult. And so progress has been slow. So here's one corner where we might like to learn, where we might hope to learn things about language that weren't offered to us by a certain kind of NLP paradigm. That would be one good place to look. And that's one of the places we will look. Oh yes, and of course, I mentioned uh, concepts and categories. Um, one that's especially near and dear to my heart because of Jurgis's laboratory for perceptual and cognitive systems is the way spatial cognition relates to language. I'm sure a number of you are aware of quite a bit of this, but if you'll notice in that little picture underneath, um, 
It describes spatial relations, ones that are fairly basic and that agents are able to effectively categorize in many different environments. And it also, I'm sure that's it's not an accident, that happens to track a relatively familiar collection of English prepositions. There's no accident here. We think, as we'll discuss a little more when we get into some details, that coarse devices of spatial cognition help to explain certain core range of linguistic expressions that are realized differently across languages. In English, they tend to show up as spatial prepositions in, as we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, well, we have some interesting data about how they show up in Latvian and it's not uniformly in prepositions. It's in quite a few different things. So we will ask about how that relates to our ability to use language. And so we're asking at this point, can cognitive psychology in all its many forms help? And of course the answer is yes. Um, cognitive psychologists have been studying language whether they knew it or not for a long time. Some of them explicitly describe their work that way, but not all of them do. But I want to say that, <coughs> excuse me, there's another side, which I will spend a fair bit of time talking about because I think it's the one that'll be least familiar to people in the room. And that's the project in formal linguistics, which is really my own specialty, which I wanna talk about in detail and talk about how it relates. So there's an obvious place to look if you're not computationally oriented, is cognitive psychology, but there's another corner of things that we want to describe accurately. And the project that I'm going to like mention a few pieces of at the very end is how to integrate these things. So, so far I've talked about, let's see, one piece of the puzzle, which I'm going to ignore, that is the computational modeling side. I've briefly gestured towards a project in cognitive psychology, Cogsci that I suspect a number of you will be familiar with. And I've said that there's another piece that's needed. I need to tell you a little bit about this other piece and this will be as much sort of background as current cutting edge research, but I wanna show you what's good about it. And so I wanna talk a little bit about formal semantics, my home field of study. And then we'll talk about how that connects in some ways to cognitive models of the sort we have just gestured towards. And then we'll talk about some of the difficult interface problems where a lot of my current focus has been on trying to make all these work well together. So that's the plan. Um, I never know, jokes are very, I have a colleague who studies how metaphor work cross-linguistically. It's never clear what's funny to people across different languages. If you're an English speaker who grew up when I did, this is a very funny joke, but I wonder if anybody else finds it funny. I can't tell on Zoom if anybody's laughing. Um, metaphor, figure, jokes are extremely difficult to translate, um, as anybody who's ever tried to translate a good work of fiction knows. All right, so I'm gonna talk about formal semantics. And I wanna go back to the beginning a little bit. And for this particular project, oh, and by the way, this is an approach that's really well, <coughs> excuse me, the weather has caused my throat to be dry and I cough way too much these days, which causes people to be very afraid of me because anybody who coughs is presumed to be quite dangerous. Um, a project that um, is deeply embedded in a lot of contemporary linguistics. The linguistics is a broad field and you will find many different projects under its heading, but here's one that's important. And, you know, my official title is professor of philosophy. You might wonder where philosophy fits into any of this. Well, it's because logic and philosophy of language was one of the places where the semantic side of this project started. But we go back to Chomsky. And we remember what Chomsky asked us to do. In, by the way, rereading syntactic structures, if you're, a, if you're the kind of generative linguist who read syntactic structures when you were you know, about knee high and haven't looked at it since, it was amazing. <laughs> um, 
Chomsky asked us to precisely describe our languages. And at the time that Chomsky did this, this was considered quite a radical thing to propose that we could indeed give a very precise, mathematically precise description of the syntax of an entire language had seemed to many people in the kind of descriptive tradition in linguistics to be unreachable. And in a couple of incredible illustrations, Chomsky showed us how to do it. Well, not all of it, not in every possible detail, but with surprising detail. And so amongst the things he showed us is how to break sentences into their grammatical parts in ways that are not totally unfamiliar, but are refined enough in detail to explain things that are interesting to explain. So in this classic example, uh, Ursula saw the man with binoculars. In English, that is ambiguous. And Chomsky asks, how can I explain what makes that ambiguity happen and why? And noticing that there are different ways you can divide up the structure of the verb phrase here between one where you have um, with the binoculars, as we now say in more modern parlance as an adjunct, and one where it's what Ursula saw shows you a fundamental difference in phrase structure. And Chomsky went on in this particular work to talk about explaining and predicting things that people had thought absolutely unaccessible, like the outrageously absurd structure of the English inflectional morphology. Um, why you say things like Ursula might have seen, might have seen the man with the binoculars. People had thought until Chomsky that this was inexplicable. And he showed us in one fell swoop how to do it. Um, Chomsky also made a few other really important observations um, about formal structure of language. These have been less in focus for a lot of researchers recently, though there were some very interesting questions that are still slightly unresolved. So classically, Chomsky asked what the computational complexity of a human language is. And he proposed that it falls, I don't know if you can see the mouse, somewhere around, not too far into the context sensitive languages, but definitely outside of the context free ones. If you know a little bit about automata theory, you'll know that that's an interesting conjecture that remains everybody's default view, even though proving it has been extremely difficult. Now, where does semantics fit into all this? I just told you about syntax and formal complexity. There has to be a semantics. There has to be meaning. There obviously has to be meaning because that's what languages do. Um, the classic description of a language, which everybody, including Chomsky, reflects, is that it's a pairing of sounds and meanings. That's what our languages are. When you stare at syntax trees, you forget that there are sounds and you forget that there are meanings, but there are both. And in fact, the main job of that syntax tree is to get the meanings and the sounds to pair up. Other creatures that have slightly different cognitive structures than we do pair sounds and meanings very differently. They don't need that kind of grammar or can't access it anyway, but we do. And so where does meaning fit in? Here's where philosophy got to come into the act. Um, philosophers working on philosophical logic had been studying meaning in formal settings for a long time. Um, for reasons that are actually historically quite puzzling, Chomsky never quite recognized that this was useful and in fact wrote some rather scathing reviews of people's attempts to integrate things. But we now think, I now think, that this worked extremely well. So our dear, I mean, not all friends, classic figures from early philosophy of language and logic, Frege, who was a terrible human being, Carnap and Tarski. Tarski was also a rather complicated human being. 
And then more recently, Richard Montague sort of started the ball rolling, talking about formal semantics for things that looked like human languages. And if anything, the main focus of all of this has been the creation of the wonderful Barbara Partee, whose name I couldn't get through this talk without mentioning. Barbara in her youth, uh, that's Barbara no longer quite in her youth, really created the field of formal semantics building on work of people like Montague, um, but if there's any one person who created the field, it is her. And so what do we do? So let me try and describe what we do in formal semantics and see if I can get you to see why it's good. What I'd really like to do for the next few minutes is convince you that it is good. Um, what we do in this formal semantic tradition is try and assign meanings to words, of course, because that's our job. We want to relate structure, form, and meaning. I will be suppressing the sound side of that relationship thoroughly, but the sound side is actually quite important. Um, so how do we think about the, name, the meaning of a, of a word? This is something we'll dwell on quite a bit. Here's the easy case, take a proper name. Take the name Anne, or maybe I should have used the name Michael. What's its meaning? Well, it picks out me, or Anne picks out Anne. If you like, the meaning is something that simply maps you from a word, which you could think of as much like a sound, to a thing. For notational verb purposes, we put those meanings in double brackets. That's the meaning, or sometimes we call it the semantic value. That's the technical phrase. And we think we know what the meaning of a proper name is. It's the thing that the name names. Um, that's the nice intuitive case. What we then wanna do is think about how to project meaning up the tree, up the syntax tree. So what I wanna do is think about what the meaning of something like a verb would be and the task I'm asking myself to carry out right now is not to just think intuitively what the meaning of the verb would be, but to think about what kind of meaning I could assign to a verb like smokes that would allow me to combine these uniformly. And the answer we almost always give is that it should be a function. In particular, it's a function that classifies things as zero or one, yes or no, depending on whether they smoke, or well, that is the meaning of smokes, the verb, is something that says yes to things that smoke and no to things that don't. If you find that to be a suspiciously boring and trivial explanation, hold on to that for a moment, we'll come back to it. Um, but for the moment, the point is that this allows me to produce the meanings of complex sentences from the meanings of their parts in a way that trivially and uniformly runs up a syntax tree. So Maria, I'm looking at a sort of modestly, it's not the most trivial example of a syntax. Um, um, Maria picks out an object, introduces, picks out a function. The result is something which, because I'm gonna be careful about it being a function with two arguments, gives me a function here, to Jacob, actually, if we fix up a little bit with the prepositional object here, um, also picks out an object which combines with the function that needs to give me a third function which combines with an object to give me um, true or false. So the crucial thing is that meaning chases syntax up the tree. That's the phrase we love to use and that it does so easily, automatically. Explaining how meaning chases syntax up the tree requires incredibly little work in this case. The only work it really requires is to decide on exactly how to represent introduce. And if you think about it, introduce is an outlier expression, at least in languages like English, because it's what we call a ditransitive. It takes two inputs in its object side. 
takes an indirect object and a direct object, or in this case, we have a prepositional object. That's a little bit unusual, and so I have to count for that. That's what makes sure I have functions at every stage where I need the functions. And then it's easy, you're done. And that is pretty and effective and captures some things we really care about. Um, oh, what I just showed you, suppose that every time we have expressions that combine in a syntax tree, there's exactly one way that those combine as their meanings. So there's built into this story, at least two conjectures. One, by the way, is that branching in syntax is always binary. That we actually really think is probably true, though it's a non-trivial claim. And two is that every time you see a binary branch, there's exactly one reflex of that in meaning, that it's combination of functions and arguments. That I actually think is false. I'll show you a little bit why in a second. Um, but it's a conjecture that one can formulate once you have these tools at your disposal. Conjecture, there's one mode of composition. Functions apply to arguments. I wrote this out here, but it takes more words than the intuitive idea really needs. Just that you have functions and arguments and semantic composition is combining functions and their arguments. This is set up in a really interesting background theory. Um, there's some really nice formal questions you can ask about complexity of the background theory. Um, some work I've been doing with collaborators has been trying to nail that down. Um, and lots of work in the type logic tradition has also been trying to nail that down. That's interesting, though I don't think we're done getting sharp results out. Um, if you know about polymorphic type theories, if you're a programming language person and you know about typing systems, you'll notice that occasionally we want something that's ever so slightly stronger than the simple theory of types, but not much stronger. Not that, that different from Chomsky's conjecture that we're somewhere just outside of the context-free side of um, automata. Let's see, how are we doing on time? Not too bad. Um, where is recent work going on this? Here's a little bit of work of mine in collaboration with um, uh, Jeff King. I'm not gonna dwell on this in detail because for the main morals I wanna bring out, we don't need it. But I couldn't resist telling you a little bit because the illustration I just gave you is an old standby, it's kind of textbook standard. I did wanna say a tiny bit about where we're going with this. One of the places where human languages show interesting semantic structure is in dependence relations. Um, there are many, many, many different sorts of dependence relations that most all languages we know of seem to display. There's pronominal dependence. John said that he is hungry. And notice that languages are extremely picky about the way they express pronominal dependence. If you're a native English speaker, or a fluent English speaker, you'll have learned that we don't allow the reflexive in the example I just gave you. John said that himself is hungry, even though it's perfectly reasonable, is grammatically out. The one that we've been looking a lot at in formal semantics is quantifier dependence. Um, John defended every student. Most students offended some faculty members. Um, every student liked some professor. We have complex dependence relations, and you can see that partly because of the different ways those quantifiers can be interpreted. Explaining what establishes the link between a dependent expression, like a variable or a pronoun, and the expression to which it depends, like a quantifier or a antecedent to a pronoun, requires us to make some interesting modifications to the syntactic and the semantic structure. Just what the most minimal modification that supports all the different ins and outs of dependence remains a research project. Jeff and I propose that there's exactly one modification you need, which is to um, introduce a second but related mode of composition and so we conjecture not one, but two modes of composition, but still a small bundle. Anyway, if you're not familiar with things about quantifiers and pronouns that may have gone fast, I did just want to gesture at more contemporary work and questions. 
The easy stuff is easy, but the hard stuff remains, as you might expect, hard. So what are we describing when we do all this? I'll say this quickly, because I don't want to run too far out of time, and I am getting, I'm going slower than I planned to. Lastly, I want to remind you that we're describing grammar here. I've told you how words combine. I've told you how the syntax and the semantics meet up. I've told you a lot about the grammar. If you like about the compositional mechanisms, how meaning grows up or chases up a tree. If you're as Chomsky as I am and you believe in lots of domain specificity for language, you can think of that as describing a highly domain specific aspect. Though you don't have to, you just have to notice that we humans do that and other animals, vervet monkeys don't and bees do it so differently that it's really hard to know how to compare. Oh, and just quickly, um, if you are a practitioner of different ways of looking at language, one thing you'll notice is that what was trivial and easy in the formal semantic tradition, how composition works, is a hard and still often unsolved research program in many other domains, getting compositional artificial neural networks. Everyone's working on it. Wouldn't want to make too many bets, but we haven't seen it yet. And where it just works in the formal tradition. One of the reasons the formal tradition is great. What does it tell you about what words mean? Here's where you might be rather skeptical because remember a second ago, I told you that if you wanted to know what smokes means, I showed you something which I made a big deal of being a function, but then I just said it's things that smoke. Not much value. A couple of areas where we can give you a lot of value. Um, roughly functional words. Um, here's a good example, the determiners in languages like English, Germanic languages. Um, it's actually quite hotly debated amongst comparative linguists whether all languages have expressions like this. It's rather hard to decide, but anyway, Germanic languages and English as a descendant of Germanic languages have rich determiner systems. I can say all dogs bark, the dog barks, some dogs bark, most dogs bark. And I can tell you what the meanings of those expressions are using a tiny bit of simple mathematics, which jumps into my simple theory of types or my background theory, which I was doing composition in easily and quickly. Again, for time purposes, I'm not going to dwell on this much except to ask you to believe that there are some cases where we can do this. I'm gonna skip the adjectival case because I am short of time, but you might notice that there are things that are very boring here. The lexicon in the formal semantic tradition is very, if you like, thin, it's unexplanatory. It tells you some abstract mathematical properties of expressions, but it doesn't tell you what gives them their central core meanings. So if you were worried about two relate, grammatically related expressions, dog and cat, bright and fast, and you wanted to know what's the difference in meaning between them, which by the way, most three or four year olds pick up, our tradition has nothing to say about it except to mark that they are different, to say, oh, this one means bright and this one means fast. It's when we look at those questions that we don't find the formal tradition helping us much. And that's where I wanted to mention um, that our cognitive, semant cognitive psychology tradition is exactly where we want to look. So if you care about fine structure of a language, if you care about why you can say, John said he is hungry, but you cannot say John said himself is hungry in English. In most languages, there are a couple of exceptions. Icelandic doesn't totally pattern with that, though we're thinking that's for peculiar historical reasons. Um, there you wanna look at the formal semantics. We're good at explaining structure and how meaning chases structure up a tree. You wanna know why dog means dog and cat means cat and fast means fast and bright means bright. You're not going to get a ton, actually not going to get anything out of the formal semantic tradition, uh, a little bit. You'll get some interesting classes. Um, if you speak a language um, like um, uh, Chinese or uh, that is Mandarin Chinese or says that have either interesting classifier structure or interesting noun classes, you'll get a little bit of interesting formal semantics. If you speak English, you won't get a damn thing. Sorry, English. You're boring when it comes to noun classes. <laughs> Um, 
here's where psychology with its rich understanding of cognitive structure comes in and helps. So I already gestured towards one area where this is fairly well known and I will, as we go forward, very quickly gesture at a couple of others where we've been trying to expand the resources from cognitive psychology and where they come in to help explain language. So think about nouns for a second. You wanna know what the word dog means and you wanna know what the word cat means and you wanna know what you as a language learner learn to distinguish those. Well, the formal semantic tradition tells you simply that they're functions, they're predicates, if you know a little bit of logic. And that's an important observation because it distinguishes common nouns from um, other corresponding syntactic structures. That's not zero, but it's not what you wanted to know if you wanted to know how I learned the meaning of dog. But of course, our friends in psychology have a lot to tell us about how we learn these meanings and how we store them. So what's in your head when you have the meaning dog? There are two, I mean, there are several competing theories here and I don't need to choose between them. You store something in long-term memory. Often we talk about this in storing what you might think of as, well, it's labeled from work of Eleanor Roche and colleagues, a prototype. A prototype are the distinctive features that seem to be crucial for dogs. Furry, four-legged, good pet, um, sometimes protects you, sometimes chases balls in the park. You might also store some specific examples of what you think to be typical dogs. And the crucial model here is one where when we encounter something new, we try and compare it to our stored bundle of information about what's typical for dogs, construct a similarity rating and decide whether that's close enough in our given environment to count. And so here's a test you can do for yourself. Do you think that's a dog? I chose one specifically to make it a little hard to tell. You might think that that's an excited porcupine, but if you happen to know the scale of this picture, you'd know that that is a dog. That's a very funny looking dog that is known affectionately as the mop dog, because when it's not jumping, it looks like a large mop. It's apparently also known as a Commodore. Um, it's not a prototypical dog, but it's pretty dog-like. And once you realize that, you classify it. What do you need to know to know the meaning of dog? Conjecture that. Puzzles to come in a moment, but as a first pass compared to saying dog means dog, which is what we do in the formal tradition, that is much less boring. So it's, as I say here, it's a halfway decent theory of nouns. What about prepositions? Here I will very quickly, and for time reasons, I'll even spend less time that I have slides on this, gesture towards the idea that we don't wanna look at concepts and categories, we wanna look at another corner of spatial, of cognition that is spatial cognition as carried out by people like Jurgis. Um, if you wanna know what the meaning of in in English is, you ask yourself things about spatial relations. And these are core spatial relations that are deeply embedded in our cognitive architecture. And so if you know this literature, you'll know that we actually have a little bit of complication here because I say the apple is in the bowl, yes, here, because it's full containment. I say the apple is in the bowl, yes, here, even though it's not full containment, it sticks out. You might imagine in this case, there's a kind of complementary closure that we wanna form a convex hull that's sort of suitably rounded out. And so once you do that, you kind of picture the boundaries of the bowl as extended and it's more or less in. People like Jurgis know that this is not the entire answer um, because we can also still say the flowers are in the vase even though there's no natural closure here that gets the flower contained. This suggests that there are two mechanisms um, and here this um, relates to work that um, Jurgis and some of his collaborators and I have been spending a fair bit of time on trying to sort this out in some of the languages that are native to you and not to me. Um, we think, as many people do, that there's an element of control here. Thing about this is when you move the vase, the flower moves. When you move the flower, the vase doesn't move so much. And so there are multiple cognitive factors that go into this. One is the understanding of 
sort of basic spatial relations of containment and the other is understanding basic force relations of support. A more complicated story than the one about nouns, prepositions are interestingly complicated. Um, so in English, we're inclined to go for this um, core topological or containment meaning, but that can be overridden by what we think of as control or force dynamics. Um, and so that is a high level hypothesis about what contributes to your understanding of a preposition in English, particularly a spatial preposition. And I'll tease you about one data point from ongoing work um, that gets back to Latvian. I couldn't resist if I had some Latvian data sitting on my computer and I'm speaking to a bunch of people, many of whose first language is Latvian, to mention that um, the Latvian locative case in many ways looks a lot like the English word in, except it doesn't always. So we have typical examples. I won't try and read the Latvian and I hope I glossed it correctly where when you say the apple is in the bowl, you mark locative case for bowl, it expresses containment. You can say the cigarette is in the mouth, you mark locative case for mouth and it expresses functional control. But Latvian shows this wonderful inversion where notice here you mark um, head as locative when you're saying what I can only render in English, she was wearing a small black hat on her head. The immediate hypothesis is we would map that to English as in, but that's impossible in English. So one thing we have here when we look at prepositions is striking variation. A big project we've been working on, oh, and I'll skip, by the way, it doesn't work the same way in Lithuanian, which means that it's highly language specific. So one of the things we're looking at here is we have highly general cognitive mechanisms and highly specific encodings in language. That's one of those puzzles that we really struggle to measure right. So the formal tradition is rather good at getting the highly specific aspects. The cognitive tradition is rather good at getting the highly general aspects. Research project that we're not finished with yet is how to merge these in this particular case. Just what is it about the fine-grained structure of the locative case in Latvian that allows us to do something which is an inversion of what we would have thought of as the cognitively natural order for anybody? Still working on that. <laughs> Been working on it for too much time and I keep not getting it right. Right, so fine-grained mapping, but broad cognitive issues that we need to connect them to. I'm over time and I will try and go very quickly here. There are a lot of questions. So how do we connect these two? We need to connect um, fine-grained descriptive linguistic descriptions, which we do in the formal tradition, with broad cognitive resources, which help us to explain individual word meanings. Um, both projects are up and running, but getting them to talk to each other has proved to be a long task. And that's a lot of what my most current work is on. Um, yeah, I'm gonna do this extremely quickly just to get us to the end here. We don't seem to get the right connection. There's several ways you can see that we don't get the connections naturally. Good formal descriptions in cognitive psychology don't uh, support the kind of composition that we see in formal semantics and in fact makes formal semantics important. Prototypes famously do not compose well. If you know the literature, this is the famous pet fish problem. Take your prototypical features of pet, which would be like a cute middle-sized dog, and your prototypical features of fish, which would be like, well, a bass, and put them together and you'd get this mashup, which is a sort of doggy fishy looking thing, but that's not what a pet fish is. A prototypical pet fish is a goldfish. Prototypes do not compose well. When we look at spatial cognition, we have wonderful formal models of say topological relations like the RCC8, if you know that computational literature, but they don't compose well either because they're big topological theories. And putting a big topological theory in the middle of a function argument structure analysis doesn't work well. So we've been working hard to make these connections and I'll just wrap up with a couple of gestures. 
Oh, and this, by the way, is a multi-group project. Um, some of the work that's going on in Virgus's lab has been important to this. My colleague, Paul Petrosky, my formal colleague, Alexis Wellwood. When pushing towards a particular model, and this, by the way, is the model I like. I depart in some ways from both Paul and Alexis and Jurgis, but here it is. Oh, this slide didn't work out very well, but it is minimal interface points. Highly localized interfaces between broad language. This is a syntax tree up here. You can't quite see it. And at the smallest levels, the only places you get interfaces to broad cognition are lexical very smallest expressions. And everything else goes on autonomously. So we have a kind of highly localized interface conjecture. And we also conjecture that there's highly specific cognitive domains that are pointed to. Um, and so we call this pointers and packaging. You have highly localized pointers to specific cognitive resources like a concept, like a highly specifically encoded spatial relation or like a magnitude representation depends on the particular lexical domain. We actually think it's super low level. Here actually I had to point or depart from Paul. Paul doesn't think it's quite this low level. I actually think that you go into, when you look at structure for interesting English, or sorry, natural language expressions cross-linguistically that have argument structure, you actually only interface at the smallest level. So at the level of the morpheme or at the level of what we sometimes call a lexical root. We also think it's very interesting that there's an extremely limited space of cognitive, cognitive sorts that are appropriate to be roots. Paul Petrosky has been conjecturing, and I think he's actually right, that they're monadic or dyadic even though language is able to express multi-edicity multi um, concepts, they do it by selecting cognitive domain, cognitive resources that are highly focused and monadic predicates. I'm gonna skip how you get a con causative verb out of that because if you know it, you know it, and if you don't, it's too fast. Um, how does composition go? This is a lot of my current research and I'll just gesture towards it. We ask to make, we try to make sure that within the formal side are things whose compositional features we know and love very well. And the entire interface is asking something which doesn't in its own internal structure compose like a concept to simply restrict an already described value. So if you think about dog, the language faculty will ask you to go hunt for a predicate that applies to individual things. All we ask of the prototype structure is to help us work out specifically that it's dogs rather than cats. What projects then is not the prototype structure. What projects then is simply what the language asked us to find. And so what we have is minimal interface and no feedback. So it's an actually extremely limited interface that we're conjecturing. Um, nothing about the internal structure of your cognition runs up the syntax tree. It does its job totally at the interface point and then is quiet. Uh, let's see. So a quick few morals. Um, I've been working with a model that includes this kind of autonomous domain that's described by formal semantics. Think of that as like the Chomsky and language faculty, it's where syntax, structure, composition all go. We think that our, broad, our cognition is obviously broader than that. We know it includes spatial abilities, magnitude abilities, navigation abilities, all kinds of abilities. We look for robust but highly localized interfaces between those two. And we keep the compositional interface one directional. We don't read cognitive structure back into linguistic structure. That's the conjecture that we're working with. That's one we hope to establish at some point in the God knows when future, but I'll wrap up with that and say thank you.
So thanks, Michael. Thanks a lot. That was wonderful. A great, uh, absolutely awesome talks. Any questions, comments, um, um, any remarks? Okay, so um, oh, Guntis, yeah, go ahead. Um, yes, thank you. That that was that was really interesting. That was a, a, a great talk. I, I just had a, 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 a kind of a question or, or about the um, the Lithuanian Latvian example with the uh, um, was it the, the locative case? The first thing that occurred to me was that it's just a historical related to uh, sound changes that, that prepositions and, uh, and similarly cases, they can map onto several different you know, kinds of these spatial mapping categories or whatever. And uh, just because of the sound changes going on between the languages, it switched from one mapping to another from, from in to on or something. And that's that's just the first thing that popped into my mind for that particular example. But uh, um. yeah, so we um, we are taking that very seriously, and so in particular um, um, here, I need to try and channel my co-author, who actually knows the descriptions better than I do. But as I understand it, um, particularly the the way that that sentence is expressed in Lithuanian shows pretty tight relations to a Finnish paradigm. Um, and that paradigm includes interestingly different, so older versions of that paradigm included interestingly different locative case structure. And so one thing we're really sort of wondering about is, is exactly as you're saying, is this simply that you know, languages don't come out of nowhere. They have histories and they gain and lose features. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a, to, to be a language we're conjecturing, you have to have the right kind of mapping to, from structure, in this case, case structure, to things that are useful meanings, but those don't come out of the blue. Um, so yeah, one, one explanation we've been really interested in is that mere historical. Um, one thing that is puzzling to us and is that the space for this kind of what from an English centric perspective, or if you took the sort of initial core observations about Latvian, it's highly restricted in domain. It works for clothing and a couple of other things. And so we are curious about whether this is brute historical accident or some combination of historical accident plus maybe something interesting about the way clothing might be represented. And we don't know. Accident is well within the space of things that could happen. <laughs> In some ways that would be the, for me, because I'm not a historical linguist, that would be the most disappointing. I would love to find some really interesting cognitive story here, <laughs> but accident is a real thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Any other comments? I have uh, one comment that builds on the one that just happened in another one. Um, but the thing about accidents is that when it comes to human cognition and all of that, none of it can happen if you don't have an architectural or some kind of physiological background. So in this case, it's not, it's more how certain aspects can diverge. And obviously there's the role of chance, but anything that has occurred um, is not you know, something impossible. It, the fact that it happened means that it, it's possible. Um, and I have a, well, I have a comment, more of a question. Um, so I, I'm personally, I don't have almost any experience in uh, or theoretical knowledge in computing. Um, I'm studying neuroscience and I, I haven't gotten that far or, or anything like that, but uh, you talked about how um, children learn quickly and all of that and the difficulties um, uh, that are faced in representing certain aspects 
um, when you're trying to compute languages. But obviously the reason why children can learn quickly, why our language works the way it does is because it is interconnected with other modalities and because uh, we have these spatial representations that do not require necessarily language, maybe at, you know when it gets more complicated, but still. So wouldn't it, trying to deal with language in isolation and trying to find uh, an actual um, reproducible way to, to just simulate it, 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 it sounds quite impossible unless you do try to incorporate, maybe if you are computing the language, maybe then you need it to interact with something that tries to spatial, create spatial representations that aids that computing system to kind of make those connections or something. It's just, I don't know, obviously you've worked uh, with this for a very, very long time and I'm sure uh, that you um, know, I mean, you know what you're doing. So maybe you can explain to me. <laughs> um, yeah, no, there's, there's anyway. <laughs> many questions there. So let me try and pull out a few that I might know something about how to answer. Yes, I mean, so it is certainly right that by the time the child starts, I mean, actually we have, we have really fascinating data that there's a certain way in which children have started acquiring their languages. The best way to describe it is neonatally. That is before birth. So here's an amazing experimental finding from some years ago, but it's, it's one of the most amazing things. Children are sensitive to the general melodic pattern of their language. Um, and different languages, it's, it's not super fine grain, you know, there are eight or 10 of these patterns that one can spot across the world and a few more outliers, but children are able to discriminate the melodic pattern of their parents' language from melodic patterns of other languages. And the data that we have that shows this gets it back to three days post-birth. And if you think about the developmental trajectory, we can only assume that that meant it was going on before birth, that three days wasn't enough time. Um, so children are learning their languages instantly. By the time they start learning their first words, so a lot of what goes on in the opening phases is their, first of all, their vocal tracts and their other, science, you know, whatever their, their articulatory abilities are not online yet, those have to get built. By the time that they're learning their first words, they're around, you know, one-ish, they're quite sophisticated. They have lots of concepts. Um, we're not really able to judge very well yet how much they have. Like, so exactly, I mean, here's a question maybe for Jurgis or other people working more closely on spatial cognition, where we know a tiny bit about their having pre-verbally general object concepts, general sort of search abilities, to what extent they do or do not encode, say, core topology. They don't know. I mean, they encode something because they're able to hunt for objects. They're not totally blind to vertices and edges and colors, but we have to ask. Um, so yes, we look at a language learner as an incredibly sophisticated agent. And they are complicated. But what is really striking is to some extent, first word learning goes so quick and so easy that it, and you can sort of mask off, right? So you can get them so interestingly. So for instance, blind children don't really have huge difficulties learning their languages. I don't remember the exact trajectory, but there's good data there that even for perceptual verbs that you might think they never understand, pe people are able to acquire. And we don't know exactly how, except that the model here is that it's too easy. Um, and people who do computational models of first word learning complain about this. The problem isn't you can't get a computational model of first word learning. Problem is everything seems to work. 
Um, you throw your favorite Bayesian model at it, and if you tune it, it works. You throw your favorite neural network model at it, and you tune it, it works. You throw your favorite causal model at it, and you tune it, and it works. Um, so we lose ex explanation here. Um, the one trial case is really important, and it does work, right? So one trial is a little iffy statistically. But you can do this with even very young kids in a lab. You, you teach them about nonce words. You say, um, so I, I show them an array of objects on the table and I'd say, find the coba. You have to pick a word that sort of sounds natural but has no meaning in the child's native language. Find the coba. And I say, look, here's the coba. And then they're done, right? I don't need any reinforcement. Well, maybe one or two. And you know, we look at time courses and maybe three or four to keep the time course really long. But compared to your favorite neural network, that's a different learning trajectory. Um, Linda Smith has this wonderful data which speaks to the question you asked about sort of perceptual modalities. Um, Linda did this amazing work of putting cameras and eye trackers on infants and sending them home. And over mass, I mean, this was such hard work. See, hours and hours and hours and hours of audio recording, video recording and eye tracker recording. And the question is what exactly is going on in the child's environment when they pick up a word? She eventually scrapped the eye tracker because it turns out for the children at the age she was looking at their visual systems aren't fully developed. And so their eyes are always focused on the middle of the visual field and the camera could report the eye tracking without needing the separate data point. She found that actually um, um, something which is not surprising except when you think about how it all fits together. So children identify novel sounds with objects that are centrally prominent in their visual fields. And they do this with incredible regularity. So it's a, it's a perceptual modality thing because they're visually running. I, actually, she didn't have work on blind children, so we don't know exactly what the replacement would be, but presumably there's a different perceptual modality. Sorry, I am. I don't think I'm actually answering your question so much as to show it's you good. It's helping. what Go goes on. into <laughs> trying to merge those things. Um, um, I mean, the, the short answer to your question is yes, all of those things are important and we have yet to understand how to put them together correctly. Because, because many languages, you know, you all also spoke about that, they're logical. When we speak, when we look at them from the perspective of syntax or computing, um, even the semantics that sometimes, you know, the words are random. And as we know, there is a large amount of chance for uh, in language development and how they diverge and at which point what you know catastrophe is affecting them either way it's a very long process and you also spoke about the psychology aspect and how you know it's 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 not it's not logical so i'm just thinking that if the ultimate goal is to be able to compute language any language um with the means of just using associations between um, individual words, you know, just relating them to each other. And the and the, re the thing about meaning is that I think it does occur like each word doesn't have a meaning it, unless it's uh, in you know in the context of other words. You know, there's a lot about the uh, Turing's test and you know the Chinese room with the thing, you know, language automatons and all that. But um, yeah, my. My comment is that it's, it's, I don't think it's plausible to just purely using uh, syntax and such computing, you can ever get to a, like a logical pattern of, of the language entirely. Yeah, um, so we are, me and some of my coworkers are committed to a carefully phrased version of the claim that we can, but we recognize that as a incredibly ambitious claim, right? That's not something that we simply observe in the obvious things that are going on around us. Yes, of course. We, we look at this and say, in spite of all the evidence to the contrary, 
Um, we really think we can. The one place where we're very careful is that we think that, you know, here I will, I will show my Chomsky and credentials. We think that grammar is more universal than it might look on the surface. Um, we really think that. Um, I, this is, I would agree. This is hotly contentious, but we, we do think that. And that means the locus of variation is the lexicon. Now there, there's clear locus, there's clear variation and that different speakers have different lists of words, different languages have different lists of words. Um, there's no doubt that there's a certain amount of arbitrariness there. Mm -hmm. But even there, we are committed to the claim that there's less arbitrariness than you might think. And we're committed to that for two different reasons. One is that we think that the same kind of uniformity and regularity we see in syntax actually shows up in some aspects of word formation. Um, we think that there are what we love to describe as impossible verbs. That is expressions that you simply cannot have. Um, here's a good example um, of something. It, this is not grammatical in English. Um, the dog barked me. Okay. Now, if you're a native speaker and you hear that, and you will hear this because speakers of some other languages will actually, if they're second language speakers, will often use the, those forms. The only direct meaning that could have in English was the dog turned me into bark. And that right. is simply because not- verb. Yeah, right. So, because it's cause, it's, it has the form of a causative verb. And English is highly restrictive in this domain. We have causatives, we have impact verbs like hitting, and we just don't have that many other transitive verbs. And that's a grammatically interesting thing, but it shows you that not anything goes. Um, the people who tend to produce the string, uh, um, um, do the dog barked me, tend to produce languages with reduced, morph with reduced case or, morpho or prepositional morphology. So I'm thinking about Mandarin speakers who say that often what they would mean effectively is the dog barked at me, but their native languages see no reason to bother voicing the preposition. So um, they're not confused. Cog Notice there's also cognitive constraints here. They're not confused cognitively about what it is to bark versus to become a tree bark. They, they have a perfectly good representation, which we assume to be just like ours, as much as we can. And that we see the language projects down even into the lexicon. So even though every individual speaker has a slightly different list of memorized words, we conjecture even there that there's less variation than you might at first think. But that's but, yeah, because biology. Yeah. No, I mean you are not wrong because there, as I said, there's just a certain limit of what you know. We do perceive uh, just cognitively things th in the same way and uh, that is our constraint and that's the commonality so you're not wrong um, and I think that might actually be the easiest part of, of the whole issue um, we also love the, rest. the seemingly quirky details which often seem random because whenever we can take what seems to be random quirky variation and turn out to offer a good background explanation that predicts the variation, we think we're winning. So we love to go find what look like random de deviations. And the, so this is why I'm so cautious about the Latvian and, and Lithuanian <laughs> vocative, because I would really love it if we had a more systematic explanation, which we thought would reveal something about the language, but maybe not. There are other things that sometimes get into the game. <laughs> yeah. Well. I, I like English. <laughs> um, I mean, no, listen, if I had to, if I was, if, if I wasn't native Latvian and I would have to learn this language, I swear to you, I don't know how, because, you know, there are some similarities in Russian. Of course, it's not, you know, um, that similar, but still. And when I learned Russian, it took, it was so hard. And then I'm thinking of those people who are trying to learn this language from zero up. English is so much easier. I love English. Everybody has their quirks about which language, which second language they think is easier or harder. Um, so 
Mandarin speakers hate English. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> and by the way, everybody hates the English preposition system. I love it. It's just so clear <laughs> in at it's perfect. You know, it's I, yeah, I don't think so you can in English you can say both I am in the bus and I am on the bus. Yes, and but that's not it's it's more cult it's more cultural psychological more that than anything else. It's not but they actually mean sense. slightly different things. Notice I'm on the bus doesn't have what's not natural meaning in most settings. Yeah. It doesn't mean I'm on top of the bus. It means I'm using the bus for its intended purpose. Right. And That's, in is more literal. Yeah, that is something which drives second language learners utterly crazy. It's like, why don't you use on to mean on? <laughs> well, yeah. because it's a human language. Sorry. <laughs> exactly. Well, okay. Thank you. I've asked enough. Um, you have inspired me to, to uh, learn more about this because obviously there's so much to learn when you're learner science and in cognition and philosophy, but this is something that I should consider as well. Oh, great. Language is good. <laughs> <laughs> we <all> Yay. <laughs> well, thanks. So, well, any other final remarks or final questions? We are slightly exceeding our um, uh, nominal time, but anyway, so it's, uh, it's a lot of- uh, Thanks to everybody for staying. I know it's been a long day for you all. Um, thanks very much. Um, well, thank you, Margot. I mean, we, we really hope to see you in Riga at some point, uh, 2021. It's, I mean, um, let's keep fingers crossed that the whole uh, COVID uh, situation gets kind of- Yes, uh, we want to be back to- uh, Normality. A normal life. <laughs> uh, we, we do really hope to see you in Riga at, uh, in the second half of uh, 2021. And, and it would be so wonderful to, uh, to, to continue those and, and other discussions in a physical co presence. I mean, yes. all these uh, physical constraints are certainly a uh, bit, well, uh, good, of course, but it's also um, uh, probably. Also problematic, so we are keeping fingers crossed that um, we'll uh, see you at, um, uh, some predictable. Oh, yeah. I just noticed in the chat. Was it Eurus who asked about the painting? Was that behind me? Yeah, exactly. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so it's it's a print of a Modigliani um, painting called "The Woman with Blue Eyes." And it has a story behind it. It's one of my favorite paintings. And I have, back when I was, when we were able to travel, every time I got anywhere near Paris where that painting is kept, I tried to go see the real thing. And every time I failed. Um, one time the museum that keeps it was totally closed for renovation. The next time I dutifully checked that the museum was open but they failed to say that they were still renovating the main hall where they were going to hang that painting. And so it was in storage. And then the next time my schedule didn't allow me to be there on a day the museum would be open anyway. So I have yet to see that painting in person. I desperately want to. <laughs> well, well, any final remarks from anybody? From, well, if there are no Final remarks, then let's uh, thank to our speaker again, and probably we can turn on our microphones and, and just, uh, it was thank wonderful. You. And yeah, well, dear Michael, we really hope to see you soon in Riga. And yes, yeah, soon in Riga. I think it'll be wonderful. <laughs> Michael B and, and, uh, and the department and the uh, until sometime very soon. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you.